we're now recording and um, as I say at the end of every evening it's a big file to download so uh, um, sometime this evening you will get the uh, you will get the uh, 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 recording from Kareem and it's a useful device <clears throat> so um, just to say how we run the, uh, the the virtual delivery it's pretty informal it's just us uh, there are there are seven of you and one of me. I've been running virtual delivery courses well before the pandemic because, because I travel internationally and uh, sometimes it's easier for my clients to work with me uh, remotely rather than uh, pay for me to fly over to various countries and pay my hotel bill. So um, I'll try to make it as near to classroom kind of training as I, as I can. It, it's very, very informal. So, um, you know, we're going to try and get to know each other over the next few days with breakout rooms and so on and so forth. Um, that's why I say it's good if you can have your cameras on because we will all get to know each other. Um, but, um, you know, get all cliche, but no, no, no such thing as silly questions. If you're not sure about what I'm saying or if you don't understand or you just want me to go over again, just shout out. You can do that just by interrupting. That's fine. Um, there's also a chat facility at the bottom of your screen if you want to talk to me privately. If I can't handle um, the discussion during the event, I'm happy to stay on uh, at the end of day and so on. Um, if you get internet problems, uh, I occasionally do, but not very often. But if you do or I do, uh, just reboot. <clears throat> just reboot and you should come back in okay. As I say, very occasionally, but I have had one or two. And if you just be patient, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll come back in. Um, uh, and that's true in the exam as well, to be honest. In, in, when you're doing um, either exam, if you do have an internet freeze or anything like that, or your screen freezes, if you just reboot, um, um, then you don't lose time and you don't lose any work that you've already done. The exam system effectively pauses uh, so you can pick up where you were. If you get huge problems, either in the course or in the exam, on, on my signature, uh, there is my email address. There's also my mobile phone number. So you can get in touch with me through those means if, you, if you're really, really struggling. And in the exam, I've got a kind of hotline to the, to the exam board that I can, uh, I can use if, you, if you're getting real, real problems. Um, also, don't worry about interruptions. Some, I, know that, I know the Amazon man arrives at some point uh, or the DHL guy, that's fine. Yeah, don't worry, that happens all the time. Shouldn't happen to me, but it may well do. So, uh, and it's always nice to see children and pets, cats and dogs. We've seen a lot of those over the last couple of years. We've had some quite interesting situations. We had a we had a German lady who was working in a, uh, a village called Tonopandi near me. I'm in Cardiff at the moment. And uh, she was quite an enthusiastic lady. And just as we were about to start the afternoon session, Christiana screamed. And I said, Christiana, what's the problem? You know, my, uh, my cat has brought me in a present from the mountain. I went, oh, it's a mouse, yeah, or, or a shrew. She said, no, it's a snake. Uh, and I said, oh, has it got any markings? She said, yeah, it's got black zigzags up its back. And well, wow, that's an adder. That's cool. Uh, so we had to, uh, uh, we had to watch um, while she uh, uh, put a, I think she put a washing up bowl over it to sort of keep it safe until the neighbor could come and help her get it back on put it back into its habitat, so that was good. We also had a lady, I remember this one very well, from, who was working in Bridgend. She was working in one of those glass conservatory extensions and she was complaining about being hot. And I said, why can you not move to another room? She said, no, this is the best room for the internet and so on. And uh, she said, but it's okay, we've, we've got a hot tub in the garden. I'm gonna jump in the hot tub to refresh myself at lunchtime. I said, well, that's good. And then she said, oh no, here comes my husband, he's heading for the hot tub and he doesn't realize the camera is on. Uh, and we saw more of her husband than we would uh, have really wanted to, but uh, hey, life, eh? Everything happens on Zoom. So I'm not sure if, you, if you've if you used Zoom before. It, it's pretty straightforward, to be honest. Um, you've, got, uh, you've got a chat button at the bottom. I'll be uh, sharing my screen quite a lot. Um, I'll be asking you to go into breakout rooms. I'll explain that when we get there. Top right of your screen, there's a view button. So you should be able to uh, uh, either look in gallery or in full screen or something like that. You can see how you can adjust that uh, to suit your way of working. So uh, any questions before we start about the way, the way it all runs? Okay, so let's start talking about our objectives then. So 
I'll make myself big. So what are we gonna do this week? Well, I keep saying this week, it's four days for most people and three days for anyone who's doing the foundation only. Uh, but the objectives are, are fairly straightforward. Oh, by the way, yeah, people who haven't worked with me before, I know Alice has. Um, very high tech uh, visual aid here. Um, I'll, be honest, I'll be honest, it's deliberately low tech um, because rather than plowing through uh, PowerPoint, I'm going to be doing most of the sessions uh, on the flip chart. And the idea of using a flip chart is we can flick back and forth quickly and readily uh, through the uh, through the things I'm doing. And you'll find that very useful as we get into the depth of the course, I'm sure, particularly perhaps uh, on Wednesday afternoon, on Thursday, um, uh, when we're building up to the practitioner ex exam for those who are staying with me. So it's deliberately low tech. Uh, and I think you'll find it useful. Also, of course, it means you can take screenshots, uh, which you may well feel find useful uh, for the exam purposes, but I'll explain more of that as we go through. So our objectives, fairly straightforward. The idea here is to understand this framework for Agile projects called Agile PM. And, and uh, you've all got a manual which Kareem has sent you. I believe everyone's got that, yeah. Um, mine is uh, is got an old, a different cover. They um, they updated this. They updated the manual in January and used um, sustainable paper, which has made it a lot thicker. I'm not sure it's better, to be honest. But there we are. But you've got a different cover to mine. But that doesn't matter. When I say understand it, understand the principles upon which it's based. Understanding the uh, uh, the terminology that we use throughout. Yeah. And, and it's worth saying that everything is based on the terminology in that manual. We often get people who come from other agile approaches or indeed other project approaches. You know, we get people who come to us from the Scrum or Kanban or Lean World. Um, we get people who come to us from the Prince2 or APM or PMI World. If those initials mean nothing to you, don't worry, uh, because they're irrelevant to what we're doing this week. But we need to understand Agile PM. Um, we're also... We want to feel that you can apply it. You know, I'll be honest with you, we don't just coach for the exams. The idea is really we would hope that we would leave you with a tool which you can use um, in uh, any ongoing working environment and any going ongoing project, agile project that we use. So um, we will be doing lots of uh, lots of case study work, uh, lots of breakout stuff as we go through. Um, and of course, you know, we will be applying it in the context of the practitioner exam for those who staying with me. So we want you to understand it. We want you to be able to play, apply it beyond the end of the course. Um, and obviously there's a third and trivial objective is you'd like to pass the exams. So the other thing we do is to prepare you for and indeed sit the Agile PM exams. And I, the exams are all, um, uh, sort of coordinated by the examination board, which is called which is called APMG. And thank you to everyone. I've checked this morning. Everyone has registered for the exams. That makes life a lot easier for me because I can activate your exams uh, simply once you've done that. Um, they handle all the exam processing. We'll be resitting the exams online on their platform. Um, and there are two exams within the uh, structure of the four days. There's a foundation exam which will be running uh, early PM on Wednesday. So usually just shortly after lunch. And then we'll need to say goodbye to Raphael, which will be a shame uh, because Raphael's only with us for foundation. Um, and that means the rest of us will then start to build up to the practitioner exam. which we'll run on Thursday p.m. Thursday p.m. So um, that, that's the objectives that we're going to do. And I always feel that there are two ways of running, running any, uh, any, any kind of learning event where there's a, an element of exam about it. And one is to turn it into in what, in my world, we call it exam factory. That would be quite straightforward because all it would mean was that I should sit or stand here 
and persuade you that together we need to work through, plow through uh, this manual, uh, chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph. I get you to highlight key phrases. Um, we all lose the will to live in about 40 minutes generally, if we were to do that. And, and it, it only hits one objective and still guarantees no success. So we're not gonna do that. That's not the objective. But what we kind of believe that the exam's success should largely come through the understanding and the application that you'll carry out through the course. So we believe we can get you understanding it, particularly on Wednesday and Thursday, applying it. With some exam coaching, we should get the best of both worlds because we feel that people should go away feeling that they understand the approach. Um, they know if they've got something they can use. And we also, if I'm honest, get very good exam results. Uh, so um, that's that's what we're going to do. In terms of timings, uh, we start each day at nine o'clock. We will definitely be finished on Zoom by half past four, occasionally a little earlier. Depends if we can keep break short and sweet. Um, so we've already got a project because we've got a start and an end and all projects are temporary endeavors. Um, our Agile PM has structure in common with um, all project management approaches. Most project management approaches have stages or phases. Um, you'll know, I hope from the pre-work that we have time boxes and increments. Um, so the end of the first time box is generally around 10.30 when we will stop for copy. But, you know, I, I'm aware that people are on camera quite a lot. So um, we will we will often stop for coffees and breaks to get people away from the screen on a more regular basis. And, and if you feel that you need a break from the screen and I haven't called a timeout, just let me know. We can take a timeout. We've got a very relatively small group this week, so we shouldn't be under too much pressure for time. Uh, we generally have a break for lunch around about 12.30. I'm, I'm in your hands about how long you want to take lunch. You're, you're an empowered group. You'll have seen again from the pre-work and from the manual that empowerment is a port, an important concept in Agile PM. I'll make a suggestion that I think around 40 minutes, 45 minutes max is about right to keep us on schedule. But again, we can work around your demands. You're the, uh, you're the empowered group. I'm just a hired help, really. And we'll take another break around around about here well we can take a short break there but again there'll be probably more breaks than that to get people away from the cameras and so forth uh so we now got a structured project uh as we have structure we need content here comes the detailed content of the uh, next few days we're going to start off by talking about agile pm i guess you'd be surprised if we didn't after coffee um we're going to do some more I thought we'd do a bit more after lunch and then more again before we go home. And that's our detailed timetable. So we, we're, we're, we're gonna leave the detail, love another agile principle until the last responsible moment. The reason I say that, I quite often vary the uh, sessions depending on the amount of debate discussion uh, I can generate with the group. Um, so um, there is a more formal agenda. You'll see it when I look at the, we look at the presentation file. But um, uh, you need to kind of trust me on content and timings because uh, I do change it around to see to suit the group. But suffice to say, by the time we get to uh, uh, by the time we get to uh, Wednesday for Raphael and Thursday for everybody else, we will hit our objectives. And in an ideal world. That would be it, wouldn't it, really? We could uh, move away from this um, and forget about uh, Agile PM and get on with what passes for a normal life. Uh, but I'm afraid it's not an ideal world. I do have to suggest you might benefit from, which is a sneaky way of saying, please, will you do some evening work? Um, and I always hate asking nice people, and I'm sure you are nice people, to do evening work. But it's kind of essential to keeping up to speed with what we're doing. You know, there, there is an element of reviewing and practicing in the evenings, probably for about an hour, maybe an hour 30, somewhere in there. Um, but I mean, it's very difficult to me to say, it depends on how you feel each day has gone. So it'll be a combination of reviewing 
the day, keeping up to speed, if you like, with what we've done, what we're doing. Also getting more to grips with the, uh, with the Agile PM handbook, which is the manual. You need to get to grips with that. You need to find your way around it. Um, and I'll be showing you how to do that. And also, um, uh, particularly tomorrow night, some exam prep in the shape of a, a sample um, uh, foundation paper, which I'll be sending out for you to work on. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I, I hope you'll be okay with that, a bit of, bit of evening work and so on. So uh, in terms of the material, it's all based on what's called the Agile PM version two handbook. I, I'm going to refer to it as the manual all week. That's a bit of a mouthful. My, mine's got a black and white cover, uh, but they've just changed the cover in January when they changed the paper. But the content of mine is exactly the same as yours. And I'll be quoting, le leading you through this. I'll be, we'll drive the, uh, the event mainly through the manual because you can actually use it in the practitioner exam. Um, you'll see if you look inside, that is based, it's split into two sections. Uh, section one is called Foundations. That's up to as far as page 63, so chapters one to 12. And then it goes into section two, which is called Digging Deeper. So through the course, we will be covering the whole manual. We'll have all that covered uh, by Wednesday, by Wednesday lunchtime. There'll be no new content on Wednesday afternoon or Thursday, but we won't be structuring the course in two parts. Uh, we'll we'll be uh, we'll be doing it all the way through. So we should, Raphael. Even though you're already doing foundation with us, we will have covered the whole manual before you leave us. Um, I also sent you last week um, uh, a presentation file which supports what we're doing. <coughs> um, it uh, it looks a bit like this. I don't know if you looked at it. It looks a bit like this, and it's been drawn together by the owners of the IPR. Uh, which is the Agile Business Consortium. Um, they, they, they control the content of the course, uh, uh, the qualification and the exams. Um, and undoubtedly you would have been on presentations where the facilitator just flicks through PowerPoint like that. And again, we all lose the will to live if we were to do that in about 10 minutes. In my world, we call it death by PowerPoint. So we're not gonna do that either. Uh, what we're gonna do is chat. We're gonna talk about Agile PM. Um, I am going to do lots of uh, uh, diagrams, lots of uh, things on in my inimitable left-handed scroll here. Uh, and we're going to use some, but not all of the PowerPoint, all the presentation to, to support the course. So it's going to be a workshop supported by a presentation file rather than just plowing through PowerPoint. But I think you'll find it useful to help you review the day. And at the end of each day, I'll send you a little email to remind you what we've covered and how far through that we've gone. And a combination of those two things should help you. Yeah. Um, I've also sent you a case study, which we'll start working on this afternoon. It's a, it's a, it's a fairly straightforward case study, um, but it's very similar to the, uh, the complexity that they, um, that they use in the practitioner exam. In fact, you know, it, it, the, the scenario we're going to use is based on something we use in the, in, in the practitioner exam. So uh, that's the timings, that's the evening work, uh, that's the handouts. Um, I thought it'll really cheer you up to start the Monday morning by talking about exams. Everybody loves an exam, don't they? Yeah, I always say I meet nice people and do horrible things to them. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there, you know, there is there is a, um, a very valuable qualification <coughs> in the, in this uh, coming out of this course. Um, it's probably the fastest growing project management qualification um, that that's been uh, that's been taken nowadays. Um, uh, the the, the, uh, the standard, I would say, in the UK particularly, but for traditional project management, is Prince Two. Um, um, but a combination of, of having Agile on your CV is a good thing. And there's no doubt that this, this qualification is really flying at the moment. Uh, it's a hot button. So I think you picked a good one to go on. Um, so the, uh, the, the, uh, the exams are all, are all um, administered, if you like, uh, online by APMG. That stands for Association for Project Management Group. And they handle the accreditation mechanisms. 
So again, thank you for pre-registering for that. Um, there are two exams which we'll sit in this course. The first one is called the foundation exam. And this is essentially pretty much a fundamental um, exam. And, and it's a test of theory rather than competency. So it's a test of knowledge rather than competency. Because what they want to you to demonstrate is that you understand Agile PM theoretically. Okay, there's no what would you do in these circumstances? There's no who's the best person to do that and so on and so forth. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a test of knowledge. And the way they test it is kind of by paying who wants to be a millionaire except the prizes aren't so great naturally, and you can't phone a friend even if you got some. Didn't help me, obviously. Uh, but um, the way I say that is they give you a number of questions. For each question, there are four possible options which are presented to you. So it's a very straightforward uh, uh, multiple choice paper uh, exam. Only one is right, and you have to pick the one from four. Uh, once again, I think it's even more like who wants to be a millionaire in that every time I've seen that question, when the poor candidate goes 50-50, they generally take away the two stupid ones, don't they? And there's two left which um, cause you some grief. There's a bit of that about it. I do honestly think there are a lot of the questions which you will see tomorrow night. Um, of the four, two you can discard, you can throw away fairly quickly, and um, um, you've got two to choose from. And this is the nature of the foundation exam. So let's have a look at that a bit more closely. So the foundation exam. Generally early PM on Wednesday. So that we can spend the rest of the afternoon building up to our foundation uh, practitioner exam. So this is a uh, classic multiple choice. And what you have to do is pick one from four. And actually taking the exam is very straightforward. I can send you a link so you can practice if you want to uh, online as well. But basically you just click through the questions that they give you. They're always labeled A, B, C, and D. Only one is right. So you just click and pick one from four. Um, they're all facts from section one of the manual. So from the foundation section of the manual, there's, there, there's no questions which could be, go beyond that. So, you know, for, if you're preparing for the foundation exam, um, you only really need to concern yourself uh, with the first 63 pages of the manual. And if you've been able to work through the PDF that I sent you, the pre-read PDF, um, I've extracted just about everything from that, those first 63 pages there. So you've already done a lot of the work. Having said it's uh, facts from the manual, um, you're not allowed to use it. No reference material allowed, which is different from the practice, practitioner exam. It's a closed book exam. It's a closed book exam. Um, and it's a 40 minute examination. 40 minutes. And in that 40 minutes, you're going to be confronted by 50 questions. And people often worry about the number of questions um, that they have to do in the time. And I only, I think I've only ever had one person that came back to me and said, I didn't finish the paper in, in many years of doing this. And that's because he chose not to take my advice. You don't have to take my advice, obviously. But um, I think most of the questions are fairly much on the surface. But occasionally they throw you a curveball, a tricky one. And, and, and the idea really is not to get bogged down, spooked by a curveball. So I would suggest, <coughs> excuse me, but I can't mandate that the best way of doing this is to get the critical mass out of the way. You can flag questions to return to. The system allows you to flag questions. Yeah. And then go back over the ones you flagged and take the same approach and go, go back and take the same approach. So you're sort of 
whittling it down. And, and, and generally, when you get, you know, there is a clock which counts down your time. And if you find yourself with three or four minutes to go and you've got maybe two, three, four questions you haven't answered, you, you may as well guess. There's no, there's no negative marking. There's no deductions. You may as well guess. You know, again, I, I make the point you can probably throw two away. So you've got a 50-50 chance of getting them right. And, and that's how you stick to time, I would suggest. That's how you stick to time. Um, uh, pass mark, 50%. So you, you need to get 50% uh, over, um, uh, over the questions. And what happens you, is you get your results straight away from the examination board. Uh, I'll be supervising the exam, by the way. I'll be... Uh, I'll, I'll be the invigilator, so um, I'll, I'll ask you to keep your cameras on for the exam. That's a nice cat's tail, early. Uh, uh, we'll have a look at the whole cat soon, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> um, um, yeah, so at the end of the exam, we, we, uh, we get together again. You get your exam feedback from the exam board. It will tell you your score. No one else will know except you, me, and the exam board. Um, and uh, it will also give an indication of where you've got your marks. And that's how that will work. And, and we, we will unfortunately say goodbye to Raphael at that point. He'll go away smiling, laughing, dancing, whatever you want to do, Raphael. Am I, um, am I guessing that English is not your first language, Raphael? Do you want me asking? Uh, no, I'm Brazilian, but I'm living in UK for about four years now. Okay. The only reason yeah. I ask is if... Um, if if um, if English is not your first language, I can generally arrange a little more a little more time for you in the exam. Would you would you uh, like me would you like me to do that, or or do you not think it's necessary? I don't think it's necessary. Uh, I okay. can understand everything. Sometimes I I'm not really good to to speak, but uh, so generally I can. Yeah. Okay. I just thought it. I just thought I'd offer it if I, if you need to, but I don't think you need to. But I always like to offer. Yeah. That's all right. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Raphael. Uh, so um, this is the first part of the overall qualification, to be honest, it's the first module. Um, and as I say, um, that, uh, that you'll, you'll have your results straight away. So fingers crossed everyone gets through that. Um, if you don't, don't worry, it doesn't preclude you, it doesn't stop you from doing the practitioner exam. And, and you'd be quite surprised, people often um, uh, do better in the practitioner exam than in the foundation exam. Um, because the foundation exam is essentially a memory test. And I'm looking around the group and I can see lots of bright young people, but certain people of a more mature age, perhaps are not so good at memory. I'm not yeah, laughing at there, Lee, I can see you. Uh, are perhaps not so good at memory, but perhaps better at practitioner applying uh, advice. So, you know, but I'm, I'm hopeful we'll all get through that. And then, then what happens after that, there is no more new content. So Raphael, you'll have covered everything that we intend to cover. So we can then, um, you, you won't want to do anything after that exam. You, your adrenaline levels will drop and you just want to go down a pub or whatever you want, whatever, however you want to celebrate. But I'm going to try to encourage you to stick with me for the remainder of the afternoon for those of you are staying, because we need to build up to the practitioner paper. And if we can make some inroads into the practitioner paper, uh, after that exam, that would be fantastic. It'll take huge pressure off the guys um, for, your, uh, for your Thursday afternoon exam. And the practitioner exam is a different kind of beast. It basically, the exam board saying, look, we, we tested that you understand it, but if we gave you a case study to work with, a project scenario, can, can you apply the advice in the manual to that scenario? So can you use the advice in the manual to, to, to deal with circumstances which arise in the project? And that's the idea of it, really. Now, you know, um, if, if, you were, if you were applying any kind of advice in, in the real world, you'd have access to the manual. And so you do for this exam. So you use the manual during the exam. So it's quite important that, you know, we, we know where to find things quickly. And I'll be trying to show you what I call killer pages, killer top, killer sessions uh, as we go through. And it's a good, good idea to make a note of that. And you can, you can put little page divider tabs in your manual if you wish. So let me just take you through the, uh, 
the ideas of practice. Obviously, don't worry too much about this. I'm just introducing these things. We will be uh, um, we will be um, discussing them in due course in more detail. So the practitioner exam. Thursday afternoon. Thursday afternoon. And what they're trying to test is that you can apply Agile PM. to a project scenario and set of circumstances. So it's all about applying the advice in the manual. I'm keeping it, it's the handbook, but I'm going to call it. Um, and so again, as I say, um, the idea is to is to replicate reality. You know, if you're applying any kind of process, procedure, advice in real life, you'd have access to reference material. So you do. You're allowed to use what I'm calling the reference manual. Yeah. So a couple of things. It's not anticipated that you'd use the manual for every question. There is, there is an element of time management, excuse me, there's an element of time management about what we're doing. Uh, so, you know, you, 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 if you shouldn't be overly reliant on the manual, really. It's there very much as a kind of backup, um, but you do have the manual to work with. Um, you have to find things fairly quickly. So, as I say, we'll be pointing out key tables, key pages, which I think will be useful. Um, you shouldn't have anything else other than the manual but you can personalize the manual pretty much to your heart's content. So um, if you feel, you know, there are, key, there are key, key phrases or pages you want to highlight, that's absolutely fine. You'll find there are lots of blank pages in there. If you want to write additional notes, if any of the diagrams I, I do up here are useful, you can draw them up in here. Um, if you want to... Uh, stick page divider tabs in so you can find key pages quickly, that's all fine. Yeah, so, you know, I want you to start, you know, to be comfortable with what you have in the manual by the time we get to the exam. Everything will be based on a scenario. Yeah, and if it was printed out, it wouldn't be more than a sheet of A4. It wouldn't be more than a sheet of A4. And it's not overly complicated. You know, we get, in, we get, uh, People attending from various industry sectors, from you know IT, obviously, from HR, from engineering, from finance, from retail. Uh, so um, it's not going to be overly complicated. It's just enough to hang your hat on in about ten minutes. Usually, they ask you to refurbish a hotel, um, organize a conference, build a training course, reorganize some business practices. Enough, enough, just to get you thinking. Um, it's just a scene setter, really. Yeah. And uh, it, it's no more than a sheet of A4. And, and you wouldn't want to spend more than about 10 minutes reading that at the very, very most. And, and uh, we will be working together, those of you staying with me, through a typical sample scenario on Wednesday afternoon. So that's what we'll be doing Wednesday afternoon, Thursday morning. We'll be working with them. And then, then what happens is <clears throat> you have circumstances which arise in this case study. So you have to deal with stuff which happens as you go through and they'll be giving things. But here's the thing, there's no writing. It's still multiple choice. It's, um, it's picking from options that they give you, yeah? So we always call it a com more complex multiple choice. Now by complex, I don't mean, mean harder. Um, there are two reasons I really why it's more complex. One is there's an element of interpretation in the questions. So for, for example, uh, they're all based on factors interpretation. They might say, for example, um, uh, who from the information given, do you, who do you believe is the most appropriate uh, individual to be appointed as business sponsor? 
is it Jake? Because he's the CEO and they always pick private sector uh, scenarios. Is it Jake because he's the key financial decision maker? Or is it Paul because he's run Agile PM projects before? Or is it Paul because he's got the Agile PM qualification? So the thing to note here is you have two choices, Jake or Paul. And you first have to decide whether it's Jake or Paul. Sorry, Paul, it's Jake. Yeah. Um, and having decided it's Jake, then you have to establish why it's Jake. Is it because he's the CEO and he may well be the CEO or is it because he's the key financial decision maker? And the role of the sponsor in Agile PM is that they're the key financial decision maker. So you, you would pick that, up, that option. So there are still four options there, um, but there are only two, two possible um, people, but you have to work out why. And again, there's one answer to that. So there's interpretation, if you see what I mean. Um, the other reason it's more complex is because there are four different styles of questions. So I'm not going to go into this yet because it's, um, it's, it's too early to be thinking about the practice for exam. But there's not just pick one from four. There are, there are some different kinds of questions. And what, I want, what I'm going to do through Wednesday afternoon and um, Thursday, uh, Thursday morning is to work together with you. We're going to work together through a full sample uh, exam. I'm going to coach you through it. We're going to deconstruct questions. and I'm going to show you all the keywords to look out for. And I'll show you where in the manual you'll find the, the, the relevant sections to help you. So it, it, it's still multiple choice. It's based on fact, but isn't pure fact. And there are four styles of question. And uh, it's a two and a half hour exam. So it's quite a long event. It's quite a long event. Uh, there's a 10 minute pause built in so that you can get away from your screen for 10 minutes within it, should you wish to. I, if I'm honest, I don't think the timing is too onerous. Most people finish somewhere in the last half an hour, 20 minutes, but we will coach you through all that as we go through. And there are only four topics, <clears throat> but they're each worth 20 marks. So overall, there are 80 marks which are possible to get. And your mission uh, is to get 40 out of 80. So again, it's a 50% pass mark. You don't have to have passed every question, but you do have to get 50% overall. Um, once again, uh, at the end of the exam, I'll be supervising the exam. Um, uh, once again, at the end of the exam, the exam board APMG will give you feedback on how you did against each of the uh, four questions. Um, it's pretty much irrelevant, provided you pass, really, but some people like to see that. Um, they will then follow up and they handle all the exam processing uh, with an e-certificate, uh, which you can download um, and uh, a, a pen to your CV. Um, you'll also be invited to uh, <clears throat> uh, claim a digital badge so you can tell all your chums on LinkedIn how clever you are. Um, you'll be placed on the successful candidates register for five years, unless you've opted not to be placed on the successful candidates register. And in due course, the Agile Consortium will invite you to become a member free of charge for a limited time. I'm not quite sure what that time is at the moment. It keeps changing. Um, so um, that's that, That's how that will work. So notice that if you want to stay on the register beyond five years, there is a reaccreditation, recertification, uh, which you can do um, either by resetting the exam or gaining pro uh, professional development points. Um, so those are the two exams. They're going to be held within the, the course. They'll be supervised by me. So I'll be watching you sweating away during the exams uh, on camera. And hopefully uh, at the end of Thursday afternoon, we'll still be friends uh, and you'll feel that you've, uh, you've got everything you wanted out of the course. Can I answer any questions about the way the exams work? Everyone comfortable with that? It's a fairly straightforward process. You just click through questions really. And I'll show you how, how the practitioner exam questions work all together. Nobody's got any questions about the exam? 
Uh, we all love an exam, don't we? I know we do. So um, <clears throat> we talked about our objectives, just introduced the exams, talked about high news and evening work, oh dear, and the, uh, and the, the uh, support materials. Um, the thing we have to do now is to get to know every, each other. Everyone hates this bit. We call it creeping death in my world. But we need to, you know, I know very little about you. Uh, I know a little bit about Ollis, of course, because I've seen Ollis before, um, but uh, know very little about you. So um, uh, let's just do some introductions. So I'll introduce myself firstly. This is me. Funny Tony Perks, funny sort of name. What can you do? From, from Cardiff. Uh, started my supposed career in the stats office, as it was then called business stats office, office for national statistics. When, when I thought I was interested in IT, um, quickly realized I wasn't interested in IT itself because I was a rotten computer programmer coder, um, but I was quite interested in the business problems it solved. Um, so I became a business, I got promoted out of being a programmer, God knows how I was rubbish. Um, to become a business analyst and project manager. And supposedly I was really reasonably good at that because I got headhunted to become a project management consultant for government, moved away from South Wales to be based in central London for what was meant to be a five-year assignment. And it was when government had money, so it was good fun uh, because we had big budgets that we could spend to support government projects. And we were pretty much free spirits. Uh, so I would get a phone call at my desk in London and some would say, we're really struggling with this project. Um, we believe you could give us some advice, which will help us. And I said, well, so I feel mate. where are you? And they'd say, well, we're in Edinburgh. Oh, I love Edinburgh, I'll fly up in the morning, spend a few days with you. They go, thank you very much. And uh, it was like that. And I, they would you know, get phone calls from the Welsh office as it was then in Cardiff. Can you come and help us in Cardiff? Well, yep, absolutely. I'll come down for a few days. I can see my mum at the same time. So I did all that kind of stuff, which was great. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of Prince 2, some of you may or may or not. Um, um, the, the team I was in sort of with some, with some private sector support developed the forerunner of Prince 2, which was called Prince. Uh, if you've been unfortunate enough to take those exams, I was part of the team that set them up. So I always feel the need to apologize for that. That's really got some momentum now. We've got over 5 million people that got that. And I did that for about four years. And, and, and the, uh, the government's computer agency, which we were part of, got in said to me, we, we, we think you're doing a good job here. And I said, well, that's good. And they said, yeah, we think you're good at this. And I said, well, that's, that's even better. And they said, so we're going to stop you doing it. And I said, sorry. They said, well, we'd like to promote you to head up the division. So you're now responsible for all these ideas. Um, and I said, and what does the job entail? And they said, well, you know, all this wandering around, enjoying yourself, flying here and there and having fun. I went, yeah. They said, well, you can stop that for a start. You can sit behind this desk in, uh, <clears throat> in central London and you can manage budgets uh, because all your staff are going to do that now. And I went, ooh, not sure I want to do it. Not sure I'll be any good at it. And they said, have a go. It's promotion. Well, uh, so I said, all right, I will. I lasted six weeks and I resigned the civil service. And um, <clears throat> I've worked in the private sector. I've been thinking that ever since. Um, what do I do? Well, obviously, I facilitate a load of learning events like this one. Anything in the change program project management world uh, is, is what I've been doing for a long, long time. Um, I don't just facilitate. I also act as an agile coach, mentor. I'm a scrum master in, in the agile world. Um, I often do firefighting on projects. Um, the, um, uh, I, I get called in quite often if projects are in trouble. Uh, there are two reasons for calling me in. One, you'd hope I'd fix it. But the other one, if I don't, um, you've got me to blame. I can be the official scapegoat. I do quite a lot of that. Um, I've been lucky enough to work internationally. I think in lockdown, I calculated I'd been in 42 countries. Uh, it stopped a bit then, um, uh, but it's picked up again now. My last assignment I was on, uh, I was in Almaty in Kazakhstan recently. Uh, which was quite exciting and quite interesting. Um, long way to go, but it was good fun and good people. Um, but I'm doing a lot more on Zoom nowadays. Three weeks ago, I had a group from Zagreb, a couple of regular clients in the Baltic area and also in Croatia, and we do it like this. Um, so you'll have come through Kareem's hands at NRLC. Um, he, he, NRLC are our training partner. 
they, they deal with all the exciting stuff like REACT funding, PLA funding, LCAS funding, and so on, which allows me uh, to do uh, the technical stuff, if you like. So the accredited company is called Aims for Change. You've seen that on some of the, uh, the logo on some of the stuff we've sent you. So we work in partnership with Kareem. He deals with money. I deal with nice people like you. Um, in terms of Agile, I've been working with a consortium now called the Agile Business Consortium uh, since 1995. And people are often surprised how long this has been going on. Think, well, I thought this was quite new. Well, you know, it has its roots in something called Rapid Application Development, which was an early 90s initiative, which um, had gained a reputation, unfortunately, for developing quick, but not necessarily robust solutions. So the consortium was formed in 1995 to promote Agile ways of working initially in the UK, uh, and now, um, uh, and latterly, internationally. Uh, and they're big players in the Agile market. And uh, um, I still first started working in Agile space really in 95. And um, yeah, it, it came about, this sort of Agile world came about, if I, if I, if I, if I can just explain, I think. Um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be treading on any toes here from the fact that mainly in the IT world, and it's not an IT work mechanism anymore. We, you know, we use Agile outside IT. Uh, but um, and it came about because the um, business representatives got fed up of IT departments running the show and forgetting that they were actually a service to the business. And so, you know, business representatives would uh, uh, would go to their IT guys and say, "Look, we 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 need we need we need to move quickly. Our competitors are doing X. There's an opportunity for us to do Y." but we need something up and running, you know, pretty quick. And the IT department would say, ah, right, okay, well, hmm. what we've got to do is we've got to establish your detailed requirements by having interviews and discussions with you. Um, then if you will allow us to document that into a specification, which we'll ask you to sign off. Once we've got all that done, you can leave it to us to, uh, to design and build uh, something to meet those requirements. We'll ask you then at the end to come in and test that you're happy with it. And I think overall, we're talking 15, 18 months. Is that okay? And the business guys would say, no, you didn't understand what we said. We need something up and running two, three months now. And they go, all right. And that was a, that was the sort of grounding for, for Agile. It didn't take off very well in certain sectors, notably, if I'm honest, in the public sector, where traditional ways of working took a long time to overcome. And also, if there's an element of procurement, because procurement is basically based on the idea of a spec that the customer would put out a specification and the supplier would say, OK, well, we'll, we'll deliver a solution to meet that specification. And, um, and uh, Agile kind of does away with that. Here's, help, here's Tony's helpful exam tip number one. If any options in the exam suggest producing a specification, don't pick it. It's going to be the wrong answer. The word specification is forbidden in Agile PM, yeah. And Agile PM basically does something a bit different to that because we, we, we take the pressure off the customer to know precisely what we want. What we expect the customer to do is to say, look, here are some high level requirements that we'd like to, to explore with you. And um, if we don't get that bit, we're still quite happy. So there are still, in fact, there are still challenges today for procurement. Um, and it did take a while to sort of um, filter down to some to some some sectors, notably public sector. If I'm honest, I do a lot of work in public sector. But I think over the last eight to ten years, it's probably called the spirit of the age. This qualification was has been going since 2014, and there are other qualifications. And I think we've now come to realise, and of course, you know, the pandemic was a great example of this, that we need to be more responsive to change. Uh, we need to be able to move more flexibly. We need to be able to adjust our ways of working. Um, and of course, you know, I guess there are better sort of collaborative tools and things that we can use. So I think over the last probably eight years, it's really sort of caught the spirit of the age. And, and you'll see it all the time, you know, things that you can now do online that you couldn't, you know, you, you can do your, your tax return online. You can get um, power of attorney online. So public sector has really picked up on it now, I think. Um, and those ideas. So I've been working in the agile space for a long time. Hopefully that will come over, that experience. Um, there are various agile mechanisms. 
Um, I particularly like that job PM because I think it wraps a, a project framework around product delivery, which gives us some good governance, particularly for large scale change. Um, there are other approaches, notably one you may have heard of called Scrum, nothing to do with rugby, uh, which is a product development approach. Uh, I'm a Scrum master and agile coach and so on. So uh, um, that, that's a bit about my background. Um, um, I got fed up of living in London. Uh, I lived in the, on, on, on the edge of Epsom Downs recently. I watched the Derby this weekend. I used to live just off there. Um, and I came back to Cardiff uh, some years ago. Um, where I'm regularly disappointed by Cardiff rugby and Wales rugby. So that's my luck, really. Um, yeah, so what I need to do, if we can, and we all, we all need to get to know each other now. It's not just about me getting to know people. Um, but um, if you could just talk us through who, what your name is. And, you know, I know not everyone might be in a role at the moment, but what sort of sector you're, you've come from and so on. Um, Agile PM kind of straddles, does it not, two things, project management and Agile. So in the world of project management, how would you rate your experience on the scale of kind of one to five? And, and what kind of roles have you played? I mean, have you been on a project board? Are you a project manager, team manager, project support? None of those. That's fine. None is absolutely fine. There's no prerequisites. I just, I can link it to things. Also, in terms of project management, there are various frameworks. PRINCE2, Association for Project Management, Project Management Institute. Um, again, if they don't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. It's just trying to find out who's in the room so I can bounce things across. We, we often get people also who have agile experience maybe without project management. Um, and, you know, the most widely used agile approach, product development approach, I would say, is, uh, is Scrum. Um, you may have come across something called Kanban. Uh, you may have come across something called Kazen. Uh, I guess we could put Lean Thinking, Six Sigma under there, sort of. Again, if none of these words mean to you, don't worry about it. Um, just um, just uh, let me know um, what you know, what you don't. And again, you know, one to five, just to give us some sort of score there. So the reason for doing that is around what we're doing for the certification. I, I can talk about all those things and show you how we blend things, because most agile projects are a blend of approaches. And um, facilitators always ask those questions. And... Um, it just occurs to me that they're, they're what we do in work, aren't they, really? But I was looking at the group when they arrived, which is one of the reasons I asked you for putting your, uh, uh, for putting your uh, cameras on. I thought, what a, what, a, what a fascinating, eclectic group of people. I thought, I bet they lead interesting lives. And uh, I always ask people if they would like to share something about themselves outside work, which might be of interest to the group. I mean, don't incriminate yourself. The last time I was arrested for being drunk and doesn't know. But I was thinking about, you know, have you got an interesting hobby? Do you know someone well known? Have you been somewhere interested in some sort of pros, part in pros? We had a lady last week who used to be the um, the Great Britain Tai Chi champion, which was quite interesting. And uh, she works in Bristol now um, on the, in the agile world. We had Liam Neeson's cousin on my course a while back. And, you know, uh, the film Taken, where he says... I have a specific set of skills. I will find you. I will kill you. Well, his cousin was able to quote that in exactly the same accent, which was a bit spooky on a Monday morning. Um, <laughs> what else have we had? Oh, yeah, we had a guy from one of the local councils in South Wales said to me, I, I've got the ability to milk a cow blindfold. And I said, that's cruel. He said, no, I'm blindfold. And I went, all right. And I said, why? He said, two reasons, money and alcohol, drunk and bet. Um, I think the best one ever I've got, and uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm occasionally lucky to work with the security services in London and Cheltenham. Uh, and in any country you work in, you can always trust the security services. Yeah? And the guy there said to me, well, something about me, I, I am in possession of the Queen's toilet seat. 
And I went, you, you possess the queen. He said, I do, I possess the queen's clothes. And I said, well, come on, you've got to explain that, mate. And uh, when we asked him about it, it turned out he'd worked in an embassy abroad. Um, and the queen and her entourage came to visit, obviously, it was some years ago. And they, they put new bathroom facilities, uh, as, he, as he said, in place for the queen to use. Whether she used them, who knows? She's the queen, or was the queen. Um, and he said, I thought it was a waste. So uh, when she left, I nicked it. He said, I nicked it, and I've got it in my apartment now. And so anyone who comes to my apartment can look at, can use the Queen's toilet seat. And he said, I've made a by appointment sign for it. And he said, I'll show you a photograph. And he did. And it was a photograph of a toilet with a toilet seat and a by appointment sign. And if, if I'm honest, it looked like a flipping toilet seat, because what can you do with a toilet seat? Uh, but um, yeah, he was adamant it was the Queen's toilet seat. And who's going to argue with the security services there? Um, so a bit about me, I do a bit of cycling, a bit of running, um, 10Ks, half marathons, I've done one marathon, that was enough, a um, bit of road biking, um, but I guess my, my celeb claim to fame, you know, you, I've had to explain who this is lately, this, this is worrying me about the youth of my delegates lately, because I, I know a bloke in Led Zeppelin quite well. And I had to explain to someone recently who Led Zeppelin was. And I just realized that there's a different age group here nowadays. But yeah, I know a bloke in Led Zeppelin quite well. I got to know them in London, so yeah. So uh, that's, uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, so let's see who we can pick on first. Ah, Lee smiling. Wait, let me, let me spot myself so you can see what I want. Let me spotlight everyone. You should still be able to see me big, even though I suppose it's in gallery now. Lee, tell us about yourself. Okay, um, my name's Lee. I live down uh, Swansea Way, looking out right now to the Gower Peninsula, which is wow. a nice place to have looking out from an office. Um, I work for Principality Building Society, so in the finance sector, and currently in the operations side, um, with a view to starting to use what I learned from this to actually move everything forward as a business. They embrace a very agile framework. Um, so I've chosen this course as like a way to be able to contribute to move within an app. Um, Scrum is a big thing with us. Mm -hmm. um, as it happens, I've done some internal project management courses that they provide, but I would oh. say like a one on the actual stuff. And for Agile one, because even though I'm party to the Agile culture we've got going, um, I haven't actually been within it. Okay. Um, something about myself, um, I'll give you two. It might not mean any, the first one might not mean anything to anyone who's not in Wales, and it might not mean anything to anyone, but my dad's best friend who we grew up to next door is Owen Money, the comedian who's on Radio Wales. Used to be in the bus many years ago, yeah. Yeah, so me, dad and Owen go to the football quite a lot. Um, and when I was in uni up in High Wycombe doing graph design advertising, I was in an ad agency doing some um, work experience. And I was the one that designed the rug, how to put the rugby emblem on the top of a Guinness pint for oh, wow. whatever rugby tournament was going to be happening because I grew up in a pub. So I knew how to do the shamrock. So oh, I designed cool. how they would put the rugby ball in. Oh, that's brilliant. That, that is it. That, we, we're not worthy, my friend. That is brilliant. That is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, we all know we money so as well. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. So are you, are you actually, is your office based in Mumbles? Or are you look, if you're looking over Swansea Bay, are you? I'm just a home worker. My contract is like, we, we got a fully hybrid approach to working from home. We yeah. all get to choose. So I chose to work from home rather than traveling to Cardiff every day. I believe you. So, yeah. I used to work with many years ago for a while. I was head of IT at Cardiff. Do you remember John Williams? Yeah, maybe not. A few years he left. Few years ago. I, I do remember the name. I've been with Principality for 10 years now. All ah, right. And my, my friend's yeah. wife was in, I think, the Red Street. Daphne Lee. Do you know Daphne at all? I remember Daphne. Daphne. She, she's my best friend's um, uh, wife. And we got a rugby together. And we got I, rugby disappointed by Cardiff. <laughs> 
And you might remember Julia Goddard. She was the oh, one that yeah, recommended I know Julia, me yeah. Yes, I remember Julia. Of course I do. Yeah, Julia, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Small. Wait, by the way, for anyone outside Wales, Wales is a village. We all know each other. <laughs> Thanks very much, Lee. <laughs> I still do. No I'll be problem. done. Soon I'm doing a jiffy ride. You know, Jonathan Davis, we ride from um, Belindra in Cardiff to Singleton Hospital. So, but this year we're going to end up in Mumbles. Up the hill, yeah? yeah, I know. Oh, i got to get out and bike and do a bit of practice. Cool. Thanks, Lee. God. Yeah, good morning. Thanks. Good morning, Yana. We can't hear you, I'm afraid. Can you hear me now? Ah, we got you now, no doubt about it. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jan. Uh, I have come from Ukraine last year. Oh, Dobro Rancho. Thank you. I moved to Wales and now I live in Pembrokeshire, Milford uh -huh. near Tenby, most popular area here. Uh -huh. uh, I worked in Ukraine in the automobile company and uh, I was international operator manager for two years and uh, then one year of executive director of the company. Okay. So cool. been a bit managing skills have been. And, and uh, currently I worked in Wales for Loki as skills advisor. But uh, I understand that I want to work more in private sector and want to upgrade my qualifications. So I think that this course will be useful for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't have any neighbor famous or something like this. <laughs> Would it benefit you if I got you some extra time in the exam, do you think? Or? Uh, yes, if it's possible, it will be great. Thank you. I can try to do that. They generally give you um, five, 25% extra time. Yeah, it will be great. Thank that you. It just gives you a little breathing space. Um, <laughs> I, I may get this few Raphael as well, just, just to give you some breathing space. Why not? Just to feel a bit more easy and comfortable. <laughs> I think it's not a bad thing if you could do that. Okay, we'll do. Thank you very much, Jana. Nice Thank to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. Alicia, how are you? Good morning. Hi, I'm good, thanks. How are you all? Um, yes, my name is Alicia Campbell. Um, I live in Cardiff as well, in Whitford. Why would you um, not? <laughs> So I come from sort of a pharmaceutical background, so I'm a scientist by training. I went to Cardiff Uni um, and did biology, and then I've been working for a small startup company in stem cell research, um, where I was sort of the team leader within the CMC development department. Um, and I've recently got a new role in Cardiff Uni um, in the Hayden Ellis building, where I sort of will be leading my own project. So I've not got... Um, like a, a formal project management background, but I've worked with project managers within the industry um, to help the project go further within the sort of technical mm -hmm. team mainly. I would say about two probably from my experience in project management. I've used a lot of Six Sigma tools, um, but again, no agile in the last, so probably a two in that one as well. Uh -huh. um, and something interesting about me is I own a cardigan corgi called Einstein. So <laughs> everyone stops me in the past for that one. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Oh, thank you. Do you get it? I always, um, I like Richard's because uh, I do the 5K run, you know, the victory, oh, yeah. the victory. Do you ever do that? That's great. That's yeah, a great yeah. Evening run, that is. I wasn't yeah, able to do it this year, unfortunately, but um, it's a really good way and a good party atmosphere there. Yeah, I really like Richard's. It's got a nice to go now, so it's a nice place to live. Yeah, it is nice. There's a really good Thai massage place called Yantala, which is okay. by, you know that? I'm just above Vander and Thierry's physio thing. Anyway, here, neither here nor there, really, but there. Hey, thanks. Nice to meet you. Okay. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Tony. How are we? Yeah, all good, all good. So, um, yeah, Paul Clark, um, just finishing off 28 years in the army. Um, engineering is my background, so not no formal sort of project management qualifications or experience but yeah a lot of the stuff that we, we i've done since i've been engineer manager pretty much could fall under a, a sort of a project heading although like i said no methodology or terminology really used um in the environment i've been in um not been on a procurement team or used that sort of academy cycle or anything um uh 
agile was wise yeah possibly since i did the pre-reading actually uh last night i was just looking at it i thought yeah so, some of the times the way we sort of plan and execute is definitely sort of agile probably not in sort of the the most sort of a organized way probably because we have to pull stuff through and sort of adjust stuff on a regular basis mm -hmm. um yeah just just within this of course i just want to get a definitive understanding between agile and the more linear approach and what the differentiations are but as, as you said um earlier definitely want to learn how to apply it and not just not just understand it yeah i'm trying to bring that out yeah and we have quite a few outcasts people you know and you know yeah. i think they when they it's a lot of it they say yeah we do that we just don't call it you know we're very good at responding tactically forming ourselves into teams taking responsibility and so on yeah yeah it's um it's, it's like right actually because um this course I, i've just landed a job already and uh, so i'm just doing out my time i signed september but um the company that i actually went for this this was this course was sort of uh pushed towards me by another company that i was going potentially going with and then uh, when I went through to the director's interviews of a company that actually employed me they asked me why have you why have you you're a seagull doing agile why are you doing that and I went mm, actually because this company said about it and he went they said you'll never use it and I was like okay that's interesting but do you know what? it was paid for I'm here and if nothing else it would just build the portfolio uh, and I'd be intrigued li listening to you I'd be intrigued if it doesn't get used it's yeah. good. To, uh, yeah, it's a hot button at the moment, mate. It's a good thing to have in your CV, I promise you. Yeah. Um, and interesting wise, yeah, I thought I'd throw in one that might might appeal to you. I'm one of about seven people, I think, um, who have got a sub 17 minute park run time at, Bas at Bastion in Afghanistan before we pulled out. Oh my god, that's amazing. Official park, official park run website. If you go on online, you can still find it, type that in. I think it was about seven of us that got sub 17. Sorry, that's 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 pretty impressive. Sub seventeen and, and doing it in Afghanistan. Not anymore. No, not anymore. No, no. now now I just um I just go to the gym and move a few weights. So, uh, yeah. Brilliant. Hey, thanks, Paul. Appreciate that's that. Right. I think you will find it's a good thing. Rafael, good morning. I don't know how to say good morning in uh, in Brazilian. Explain to me. Bom dia. Bom dia. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. perfect. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rafael. Uh, in Brazil, I have been like working with civil engineering, but I wasn't happy with it. So my wife and I decided to do something different with our lives. And four years ago, we came to UK. And since this, I, I have I worked as a chef <laughs> and then warehousing factory, like everything. But then I decided that I wanted to pursue like a career, something that I really like it. And last year, uh, I saw the opportunity with the Welsh government to do a personal learning uh, account. And I, I was studying web development. And I finished my course like two months ago. And I'm planning to start my job hunt uh, next month. And I think the project, Agile Project Man Management Fundaments uh, will help me with this as most of the big techs are using this approach, uh, mm -hmm. especially Scrum. And uh, I was checking the book here as well, even when I, I was doing like my projects. If I, I knew this by the time, how to approach mm -hmm. and not put the futures uh, as a fixed variable, but time and cost, but I wouldn't have the cost, but cost like I think times double. Mm -hmm. And the quality, I would have been like doing much better projects uh, cool. on my course. <laughs> You're already using it. Well, that that. <laughs> and the Moscow approach as well, like what what like we must have, we should, and we could have. So, if if you stop to think, uh, looks like it's like silly things, but it, it's not. It's it's really important, and mm -hmm. and know how to apply it is 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 I think is is a good knowledge as well. Cool. And uh, I don't have any interesting neighbors, uh, so <laughs> I think the most exciting thing in my life happening now is next month my baby is born, so <laughs> I'm really excited about it. <laughs> is it the first first baby? Yeah, it's the oh, first man. child. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow! That, uh, I hope it sticks to time for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exciting, exciting. Thank you very much, Raphael. Thank Olives, you. Uh, Dobro Rancho. How are you? 
Fine, доброго ранку. Um, I'm from Ukraine. I have come to uh, Wales uh, last year with the war. Um, I work like um, a chief of a legal company. Uh, but uh, last year, as before war, my, my work, my um, things that I do at my company uh, mostly related with managing people and managing process, managing uh, uh, companies' uh, business approaches. And uh, when I read about Agile, it's the thing that I do accidentally, but I don't know that it's called Agile, because I, always, I was always flexible uh, with, uh, uh, with pathways, with routes, how to uh, deal with uh, problem that I need to solve. And that's why I need more formal learn, uh, knowledge and more formal things to understand how the thing works. And I suppose that will help me to get job here because now I'm working, uh, I'm working online with my Ukrainian company and doing the, the, the same thing that I did before war. I organize processes, uh, special legal cases in my company, and I like to, to think uh, strategic, strategically and make some plans and uh, making it to the right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Alice. And you also have extra time in the exams. It's just breathing space, yeah? It will be brilliant, yeah. Thank cool. you. And I'll make sure that uh, the others do too. Uh, and last, but definitely not least, Jake. Oh, thank you. It's, it's all been built. You, you, the bar's been set now, Jake. You have to be at least a member of a boy band or a, a UK champion in something. Otherwise, wow. You know. No, unfortunately not. Good morning, all. I'm Jake. I'm from uh, Sunny Carmarthen. Um, work as a project manager within the NHS. So I've recently started that role within the last six weeks and it was deemed uh, critical to to my post to um to attend this training um so i'm working on community clinical systems um i've been in the nhs for around 10 years um working a range of different technical roles so i've been product owner of systems it support etc um, prior to that, I've spent some time in the local council here in Camarlin. Um, I've done a bit of prints in a previous role, um, got the foundation certification, but it was at a time where I wasn't really working projects to such an extent. So it was just the case of getting through the exam, um, getting certified so. and not really much of it has, has stuck, unfortunately. But as I said, Agile, I think, will be key to my role going forward. Um, I'm focusing currently on product delivery. So trying to work the backlog of items through the software development lifecycle. Mm -hmm. um, I do a bit of running myself. Unfortunately, I'm sat here at the moment with my leg raised. I was due to run Swansea Half this Sunday. This weekend, yeah. Yeah, but I've sprained my ankle last week so it appears to be off the table for now that's a shame nice run that along the along the bay there really nice nice flat run as well yeah it would have been quite hot mine so it might yeah. be a blessing cool so um did you do that running or was it just just no typically i did a long run in the morning i did an 11 mile and had no issues at all and then i sprained it mowing the lawn <laughs> oh, no. oh, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, you'd expect that. That's harsh, like in the harsh, mate. Oh, dear, dear. That'll make you a collective supporter there. What are you, Scarlet, if you don't there? Would that be right? Or? No, I don't follow rugby. Oh, one, okay. of, one of the few out west who don't. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Our best thing to do, we're all in chaos at the moment, anyway. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, thanks, everyone. Um, thanks for doing that. I appreciate uh, everyone's uh, joining in with that. So we've got a, a nice, interesting group. Um, uh, Paul, I'll try and link it to a bit of traditional thinking. I'll try and link it to some of the Scrum ideas as well. Um, um, I think I've got something for you to do now, which is going to be quite hard because you, you, you have no experience of this. So I was going to offer you a quick 15-minute coffee. Would that be about a good thing to do to get some caffeine in before we do something difficult? 
we can have enough caffeine in this world. So let's meet again at 10.35 and we'll, we'll do this really hard exercise. So get your brain straight. See you soon. And so we're back in the room. At the fast show, isn't it? So have we got everyone? I think so. Uh, excellent. Um, just to let you know, Yana and uh, Raphael, I included you in the email as well. Um, I've, I've asked the exam board to give you a dispensation on time. You, most people don't need it, to be honest, but it just gives a little, a little breathing space just in case. So here comes the. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. I'll let you know when that comes through. It'll be all. It'll be at. It'll be added automatically to your exam. Then there won't be a problem with that. I don't think. But. We, we never know until day one of the course who might need it. So we, uh, and it's not something you can do yourself. So we have to do that. No problem. So this um, first exercise is going to be quite tricky for you because you'll have no experience of it. Um, so uh, let me just try and get out of that a minute. Ba -ba Here we go, I'm getting there now. So uh, I'm going to split you into two groups in a moment to, to do this exercise. Um, I don't know if you've used breakout rooms on Zoom before. It's very straightforward, to be honest. Uh, what happens is I'll, uh, you, you, you'll you be asked to join the group. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get everybody working with everyone over the next few days. There's quite a few breakout exercises. There should be an opportunity for everyone to meet each other and have a, a discussion. So um, you'll be asked to join the group. Um, I'll leave you to, I usually use the word fester, but it's probably not the right word, is it? I'll leave you to, uh, to your own devices for a few moments to think about it. And then I'll arrive in your room like a bad smell uh, and just be a bit of a nuisance and then leave you to it again and so on and so forth. At the end of the breakout, I'll close the rooms and you'll be asked to join the main room. Uh, so it's very similar to Teams in some ways, but just in case you haven't done that. The, the first exercise is a very tricky one, really because you'll have no experience of this personally. Um, and uh, what I wondered if I could persuade you to do in the groups I shall put you in fairly shortly, is to debate and just come up with a number of points on the answer to this question. Why, in your opinion, stroke experience, does change fail? Now, as I say, a difficult thing is you've only been ever been used to successful initiatives. So obviously you'll have to uh, rely on things you've heard about um, a, in other organizations, in the press, media and so on, because you've only ever been in successful organizations running successful change initiatives. So um, but all I wonder if you could do is just come up with a, some, as many bullet points as you can. Um, and uh, that, that we can sort of bring, do something with later on. But as many bullet points as you can. Why, why does change fail? So let me let me put you into breakout rooms. Wow, wow, wow. So we're going to two, I think. Yeah, two breakout rooms. Um, I'll probably shorten this somewhere. Yeah. Oh, I think that works quite well to get us going. Uh, so um, here you go. If you could join the rooms, I'll leave you for a few moments and I'll come and join you in due course. Yana, can you join the room? Yana.
That was fast. I think I think Alicia won the race back into the room then. We usually have a little bit of a competition. Closely followed by uh, by Jake and Paul, I think. But Alicia's gold medal there, I think. Never mind your park run there, uh, Paul, to be honest. Um, well, I think I think she was probably bored of me talking because when I start talking, I get I get called in my, my mate, a couple of mates of mine call me um, a lightweight field generator in the army. Because once you turn it on, it's just <laughs> so I apologise if I if I just get carried away. <laughs> we've lost uh, Yana at the moment, and we we've, we've lost Oles. Well, so we lost. We've lost. Um, well, we've only got the one group in, haven't we? That's what's happened. They haven't come. They don't want to come back to us. Oh, here we are. Both time two. What? Yeah. Come, <laughs> come on. Huh? Well, everyone was waiting for you, and Yana's last bat late as well. Come on, uh, <laughs> competition to get first back here. Yeah. I think we got everyone there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks for that. It's also an opportunity to get everyone to get to know each other as well. To be honest, so uh, appreciate that. Um, I just wondered. Uh, um, all I asked you to do in the end, really, was to work out how many you had under each each broad topic. No more than that. Um, but. Um, can I ask um, the group Lee that you were in, can you just give us your numbers here? How many under people, how many under process, how many under tech? Yeah. <laughs> well, I got kind of designated because I wrote things down. So yeah, he's, he's our Scrum Master. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as as, uh, as Paul will know, you never you never never volunteer, Lee. That's right. Isn't it? Yeah, always never volunteer. Look after your kit and make your own travel arrangements, isn't it, Paul? That's yeah. it, isn't it? Uh, so under people we had five. Yeah. Um. Then we had three in between people and process. Yeah. And then we had two in process right and then we had three in technology so you're more used to failure than i thought to be honestly so um hey we've we've tried it <laughs> it's failed in principality we've picked ourselves up and changed culture <laughs> <laughs> uh what about the other group um which got uh jake and paul uh, in it if we can someone can someone volunteer for me So you go in there, Paul. I think your documentation is better than mine. There we go. Because <laughs> mine's non-existent. Um, okay, okay, I'll go in then. I'll, you're playing on, you're playing on the injury, uh, Jay, can't you? My leg's up, I can't write. I so couldn't write with my leg, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. And <laughs> yeah I, I, I deliberately didn't take it on then because I thought I was talking too much. Okay, we've got... So for people, I, I clocked the people. And then processes we have... I missed your people's score. Sorry, Paul. My fault, I think. Four we had. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then technology, we had two. Two. That's okay. You're, you're coming in and out, Paul. I've got to say, I don't know if you're saying you, you've obviously spoken too much because the mic stopped giving you every other word now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, okay. Okay. So some of ours would possibly sit between people and processes, yeah. but we sway. Sort of in okay. yeah. Okay. What, Lee? What were your attack ones? What were they? Just unmuting. Um, the tech ones were from a budgetary point of view. If oh, right. the the tech spend hasn't been properly thought through, um, if an incorrect product is chosen, mm -hmm. and if the technical advice given actually isn't worthwhile okay so the one was really about budgetary as well yeah so the... it was yeah to be fair it was all about if at the beginning you don't get the right advice to look for the right product and have enough money that's the main and to be honest with you i've seen it in my own company yeah. unfortunately what were your two tech ones paul do you mind me asking well, even if you do mind me asking, I'm going to ask you. Uh, they were just un un understanding of tech, and we put lack of resources in there. Okay. But the interesting thing, well, I think it's interesting, you may or may not agree, 
is that most of your most of your points of failure up here, very few down here. But if you ever see uh, reports of, of large scale system failures, particularly in the uh, uh, in the press, it's always kind of computer said no, isn't it? You know, DVLA's paperless yeah. tax disk doesn't work. Universal credit systems don't work. Stock exchange systems don't work. Bank systems failure. And of course, it's not really the tech, is it? The tech is just the enabler to the change. It, it's people and process um, yeah. that make make or break change. I think. You know, and you can argue about what what fits under each one, but th this is what I'll be honest with you always happens. You know, you get very little on tech. It's usually um, being stuck with legacy systems, outdated infrastructure, not having the uh, the right technical support, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, you know, th this is what we're going to try to attack really with our job PM. Um, we're going to recognise that it's people that make or break change. But if we can support them with some reasonable, flexible process, we ought to get the best of both worlds. And that's what we're going to try and see that Agile PM did to us. Um, I am, um, let me just do something here. I'm going to mute you all for a moment, only because I can hear a lot of background noise, which I think we might disturb people. Um, okay. Um, don't let that stop you jumping in and asking questions. Oh, could I temporarily mute you? So I think I could hear some background buzzing. I don't know else can. Um, I, I, I was bouncing between the two groups, the best group and the other group. You know who you are, of course. Um, um, and I, I, I didn't, I don't, I didn't notice anybody asking this. But did either group ask himself, what does failure look like? Because people go into denial, don't they? Don't you think? You know, I, you see it in sports teams, don't you, where they lose. And God knows, coming from Cardiff, I'm used to losing. Um, you know, and the coach goes on television and says, oh, well, we can, we turned the corner, we can learn lessons, you know. Mate, you lost again, didn't you? You lost again, you know. And, and, and what I also feel is at the end of a, uh, at the end of projects which have been unsuccessful, and there are quite a lot around, people try to claw out <laughs> success factors which aren't really there. We spent all this money. We 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 we've been quite visible. How can we make failure look like success? So, what one thing to maybe think about is what does success look like? And and you have you have different perceptions of success. For for example, um, if you ask a project manager what what is a successful project, excuse me. If you ask a project manager what is a successful project. They, they usually point you to what is in my world often called the project manager's triumvirate or triangle. <clears throat> and, and they would say, well, it's, it's obvious, isn't it? You know, we delivered everything that was asked of us. Uh, a couple of people have talked about being product owners and product, product development. We've delivered all the outputs, all the products. Um, it all works. You know, the building has the health and safety certificate. Um, the... Uh, uh, the, uh, the payroll system calculates PAYE properly. Um, the, uh, the, the, the payment process is cyber secure. We came in on time and we came in on cost. Obviously, this is a perfect world, yeah? Oh, and we handled anything unexpected which arose en route. Because as, as the project manager, yeah, this is my role in life. The project manager's role is to deliver outputs, which will be of use to the business. And, and you see this in various ways. Uh, for example, I've, I've got a friend, obviously just the one, um, um, and my friend Simon has just retired now, but for many years, um, he's despoiled our country with orange boxes, really big orange boxes, massive orange boxes. And basically, as far as I can work out, um, Simon uh, has found a retail park or a motorway junction and thought to himself, they could do, we could do an orange box there. Eh? I'll put a big orange box down there. And he's done it at San Samlet. Uh, he's done it at Carmarthen, I know. He's done it at Kefartha Park in Merthyr. He's done it at Calver House Cross. He's done it at Cardiff Gate. Um, and when, he, when he's finished 
with his, putting his big orange box down. He hangs a big sign outside which says B and Q, and and that's what my friend's done for about thirty years. So he's done, he's put B and Q box things down. And if you've been in one B and Q, you've been in them all, because the retail experts have worked out the best sort of use of the of the footprint. And you know when you go into a B and Q, the garden centre is going to be over there. The electronic pointers, uh, sale tills are going to be here. You know, the builder's yard is going to be over there. And basically, he, he's done. And he gives the keys to a store manager and says, there you go. Should be able to sell lawnmowers now. Should be able to sell kitchen units, bathroom fittings, and all the rest of it. And, and he goes away and tries to look for somewhere else to build another B&Q. And if that store manager doesn't 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 uh, sort of how can I put it? If he doesn't sell the expected number of kitchen units, the expected number of bathroom suites, the expect expected number of lawnmowers, it's not my friend's problem, is it? Because he's done. He's delivered. You know what he would say was a successful project. It, 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 it's it, in a similar vein. There's something I do as well. I develop training course materials for a lot of the uh, quite a few anyway of the large. Um, project um, uh, and change management um, companies, commercial companies. And generally one of their sales guys will phone me up and say, look, hi Tone, um, we've, we recognize there to be a niche in the market for a certain kind of agile or change management course. We'd like, you, we'd like to engage you to build it for us so we can advertise it on our internet, on our website. And we'd agree a price and a time scale. And I go away and I develop training material case studies, I get it accredited by the exam board, and I ship it back to them electronically so that they can use it to attract delegates on their on their website. So they would load it up on their website. You know, and once I've delivered my training materials, I expect to be paid. Don't always happen to be honest, but I expect to be paid, you know. And if nobody books onto that training course, well, I'm A, I might not know, but B, other than my ego being slightly bruised, it's it's not my problem. You decided strategically you wanted me to build that training course. You know, um, I, I'm done. I, 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 it was success to me because I've done what I was wanted. But you know, my 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 my, um, my clients don't really want my training course materials. What they want is the revenues arising from the training course being advertised on the on their website. Um, Kingfisher PLC that own B and Q, they don't really want orange boxes. What they want is sales generated from people going into the orange boxes. But this is not the project manager's standpoint. She or he has finished this at scale. But someone needs to be thinking about more strategically about why they want to build the box there. So strategically, Kingfisher PLC would surely say. We have done some research and we believe that if we had a big orange box, a Hans Hamlet on the edge of Swansea, we could, really, we, could make, we, could, we could generate sales of 300 grand a week. If we had a big orange box in Carmarthen, we could generate sales of 500,000 pounds a week. My clients, my clients would say, OK, we've done some research on the market. We believe if we, if you, if we did have this course on our website, we could generate 12 delegates a month. So somebody needs to be thinking more in terms of what in traditional project management we call benefits. And some people in the scrum world and so on would call it value. We tend to call it benefits. And benefits are, watch out for this word, measurable improvements. In business performance expected to arise from the change. The key word is measurable. It doesn't have to be financial, but it has to be measurable. So this should be the starting point. We, we think we could, we could generate sales of 300 grand if we had a B&Q in Clan Samlet. That's the outcome we're looking to achieve. And therefore, we'll ask Simon to build a B&Q. We believe we could generate sales of £20,000 a month if we had this training course on our website. That's the change we're looking to put in place. Therefore, we'll ask Tony to do it. But the point is, the strategic thinking about the outcome and the benefits is not really the project manager. 
This is a role that in Agile PM we call the sponsor. Public, public sector school tends to call them the, um, the senior responsible owner, SRO. Prince2 calls them the executive. Some people call them the project champion. We call them the business sponsor. And, and they're very much focused on, can I use a bit of shorthand here, return on investment, making sure that the gain outweighs the pain and making sure that the project is from the outset and remains during its life, value for money. Yeah. And this is the role of the sponsor. And in, in my world, I think too many people are output focused. We need to be more, we need to be focused and we do in Azure and much more on the value for money, the benefits expected to arise. And that's another key principle of Agile, really, that we've, we drive by value rather than by output. Otherwise, you have what we often call vanity projects, where a senior leader has a, oh, I'd really like a new website. I'd really like a refurbished office. Why? What, what's the point? So, you know, this, if you think of this in a fairly sort of simplistic way, this is the expected gain that we would achieve through going through this pain. And if the gain didn't outweigh the pain, why, why would you start the project? Why, why would you put a hundred thousand pounds, for example, into a marketing campaign, which was only likely to relinquish fifty thousand pounds worth of revenue? And the answer is you wouldn't. Yeah. So you've got to think fairly carefully about this, and that's why at the beginning of projects, there's generally some form of business justification for the project. usually documented in the shape of a business case. Just to demonstrate that at the start, the project is, is desirable and, and viable. You know, we do anticipate that the gain will outweigh the pain. But the point to be made is these are just targets, aren't they? You know, when, <clears throat> when my clients ask me to build a training course, they don't really know how many people are going to be um, uh, attracted to it but they have some market research. Kingfisher B at PLC uh, don't really know how many lawn mowers, how many kitchen units, how many bathroom suites they're gonna send, they're gonna sell, but they have done some research, but they're just targets. So surely what we need to make sure is that there is a continued or ongoing justification for the project. And one of the reasons for break, breaking down the project into what in Agile PM we call increments is it gives you an opportunity to formally check that the project is still on track to deliver some, some positive return on investment. And if for whatever reason it isn't, maybe we should scrap it. Maybe, maybe because a competitor has beaten us to market, maybe because corporate strategies have changed, Maybe our view of market conditions have changed. Maybe tech has changed. You know, if you're in a local authority, if you have an election and you change from Labour to Liberal Democrat or whatever, you know, strategies change, ownership changes. And that's why we, that's one of the reasons why we break our project down into what we call increments. If I can ask you a really tricky question, now think of my friend that builds B&Qs. Think of me, if you like, that builds training courses. If we start the project here, and then we close it here. So the close of my, my friend Simon's project is when he gives the keys to, of the B&Q to a store manager. That's the end of the project as far as he's concerned. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the end of the project as far as I'm concerned is when I email my training course materials properly accredited to my client. At what point does the customer, does the client, if you like, Kingfisher PLC, my client, at what point do they get their benefits? What do you reckon? Where do they get some sales in that in that life cycle? When, well, sorry, when they get the keys. When they get worried, sorry, when they get the keys. So after the project. Yeah. I mean, at the end of my friend Simon's projects, you know, Kingfisher PLC hadn't got any seek haven't got any uh, sales, what they've got is a big orange box and the keys to it. You know, when I deliver my uh, training course materials to my clients, they, they haven't got any, gener any revenues, they've just got my training course materials. So if you think about that one, and this is kind of a traditional approach, 
you have to go through all the pain in the hope of getting the game. Because you might find that nobody wants to go and buy, nobody's interested in my training course, nobody's interested in uh, in, in do it yourself stuff in, uh, in, in, in Merthyr. So surely anything we can do to try and generate early return on investment is a good thing. If we can structure our project, and I admit you can't always do it, if you can structure your project to get early return on investment, then um, that would balance out the gain against the pain. We could get some early revenues, which would fund later increments and so on. And you see this all the time in North Cardiff, Alicia. Um, I don't know whether you agree with me, but Cardiff is basically a building zone right now, isn't it? <laughs> My daughter lives in Radford, by the way. Up, uh, oh, okay, so if yeah. you've got the Hampshireson Road, there's like mm -hmm. Sylvanian family estates arising F right in the centre, aren't they? Yeah. Um, I've got good friends in Lisbon and Pompreno. They're joining up now, aren't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. If you're a building company, let's say Redrow or Barrett or Charles Church, and um, you've got uh, planning for permission for 2,000 houses, it would be foolish, wouldn't it, to build all 2,000 and say, OK, guys, now we better get some money into this business. We've got to try and sell them because you've had to go through all the pain to get the gain. And also you might've been building the wrong houses. So surely what, uh, what a building company would do is say, okay, what we need to do is to plan our development of 2000 houses into blocks of releases, increments, if you like. The first release, the first increment will be, let's say 103 bedroom houses. Then, we act, then we're gonna build a second release of 54 bedroom houses, then the third release and so on. The idea being, of course, that the revenues from the first release will pay for the second release and so on and so forth. And they also, it gives us an idea of an, an ability to, uh, an option, an, uh, an opportunity, sorry, to validate that we're building the right things. But if we release our first block of 103 bedroom houses and we find that people aren't buying them, so sales aren't coming in, we could do some market research. We could say, well, what's happening here? Why, why, aren't, why aren't we? Well, you know, people are saying we should be building two bedroom starter homes. That's where the, that's what the market is. So we say, right, well, perhaps we should adjust what we intended to do ongoing. So it gives us some flexibility to our approach. And this is all, this is all incremental approaches, which is one of the features um, of an agile development that we should try to get early return on investment through, through early release of, uh, of, of products. And that's all it is really. And we've been doing it for years, we just called it phase release. So it's quite interesting how you measure success because the real measure of success is did we get the revenues arising from the change? Now, this idea of breaking it up into an incremental approach, you can't always do it, I realize that. You know, but you do see it all the time, don't you? You know, in, in building sites, you know, if you're building a new retail center, what do they tend to do? Put the flagship store in, put the uh, uh, put the um, car park and a few restaurants in, open up to the public, people, footfall arises. They don't wait till every unit is full before you open up the, the shopping centre. You know, it's, uh, it's like down at Bluestone in Pembrokeshire, you know, what they did originally, they had a basic, basic set of facilities there. They attracted revenue through the early, early holiday makers. Um, and then more people came in and they could expand it and develop it and so on. It's what we call an incremental approach. But the traditional way of working tells to legislate against that. And the traditional life cycle, this might be something Paul was interested in, is often known, uh, I don't know if anyone's come across this, explain, this phrase, as the uh, waterfall life, life cycle. Did they use that when you went to your new client, your, your new job pool, Waterfall? Yeah, and I've done the um, I've done the APM PFQ as well. So, oh, um, okay, linear, so linear Waterfall. Yeah, they. they yeah. So you're well versed in that if you've done APM. Oh no, okay. don't say I'm not well versed now. Okay. <laughs> I won't go I that just learn. I just <laughs> learn it. Pass the exam, if I'm honest. I won't go too far in that direction. Uh, but the traditional waterfall, you know, different, different frameworks have different names for the phases, but basically it's all the same. Firstly, we should do some analysis, which is to find out
what the customer wants. You can have a meaningful discussion about wants or needs, but it doesn't really matter at this point. Then having done that, we would, uh, we would move into specification. But that's essentially document the requirements. The requirements being what the customer wants. And I always think it's useful to get your client to sign that off in blood so you can hold it against them for the rest of their careers. That's always a helpful thing to do at that point. Um, then we move into design, which is design how the solution will meet the requirements. My pen's getting a bit daffy. I'll we'll change that in a minute. In other words, how will we meet the what? Excuse me one moment. Will I change your pen? Then we're going to some form of build which could be in the building world, physical construction. In the IT world tends to be coding, web design and all the rest of it. I'm gonna be quite cynical now, but we probably run out of time. So we'll have, to, we'll have to squeeze the next bit, testing. Is that too cynical? Not in the IT world, it's not, I tell you, yeah. And then we will implement, roll out, call it what you will. The solution. And it's often called the waterfall approach because unless you're a salmon, it's quite difficult to swim back upstream. Yeah, uh, because it's based on what we call, you can use the word there, Paul, thank you, linear. We could, it's based on finish start relationships. Once we finish this, we can start this. Once we finish this, we can start this. Finish, start, finish, start, finish, start. Yeah. So, the project is only in one point at a time. You're either in specification or in build or in test or whatever. And although you can go back upstream, it's quite hard. And um, it also means, of course, you don't get anything till you get everything. So, yeah, so the idea of delivering in blocks is quite difficult, although you can do it. I am exaggerating to an extent. But the big deal really is that everything is based on the idea of a specification. You know that we have this specification which is pinned down as a set of features requirements and everything thereafter is based on the specification so if we get the specification wrong everything behind it is wrong but nobody can be blamed because i designed to the spec we built against the spec we tested to the spec we implemented the spec so this gives you kind of one shot at getting it right and of course, because you've got a lot of work down here, if we have to change the spec, it causes a lot of rework. So we, we move away from that idea in an agile thing. And of course, the specification is based upon the customer being able to express in some detail, you know, in 100% detail, what they want. And people say, well, of course, the customer should know what they want. <laughs> You know, I'm saying, well, well, why should they really know what they want? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've been guilty of this in my, my early career. I'm not particularly proud of this. I, had, at one point, I was an examiner for the British Computer Society's uh, business analysis panel. I, I dropped it now, but um, I know, and I, I, I remember doing this to one of my customers in the early days, um, going to talk to somebody about what their, what their future requirements were. And he said, I'm not really sure. And I said, well, when you are sure, come back to me and I'll build you a solution to meet it. And he went like, all right. <laughs> and that wasn't very nice, was it? Because, you know, why should the customer know absolutely what they want? And surely, you know, if we're introducing change, if we're running product development or project life cycles, we should be showing possibilities, getting them to consider options. What do you think of this? How do you feel like that? Would this work for you? And so on. And sort of expecting them to know it up front is, um, is very difficult. I mean, if you go shopping, whether you do that online or whether you do it, you know, in, in, in a real physical way, 
I, I don't know about you, but I typically don't know exactly what I want. You know, I, I, I set some high, you know, I set some high level objectives, like uh, um, I'm going on a holiday in six weeks, I'm going to a hot country, I realize I haven't got enough um, shorts and, and, and t-shirts, how much can I spend? I've got 250 quid. I'll go and see what's out there. You know, that's the way it works. You know, <clears throat> if you go and buy anything like a television, you know, you, you either look on the John Lewis website or go to John Lewis and you say, look, I want a smart TV. I'm thinking of this size. What's, what's out there? Which is the best mate? You know, and surely that's what we should do in the project. I've got a really good example. Well, I think it's a good example of this. Um, I, um, I've, I've got two granddaughters, uh, one who lives in Cardiff, uh, Eve Caris, and one who lives in Clapham because she does, her mother doesn't believe that the world exists outside the M25. And that's near Arwen, yeah. And near Arwen was going to get christened shortly after the um, uh, after the pandemic end, ended. They, they they held it up while the pandemic was on. So they announced my my daughter and son-in-law. So we're going to get near Arwen um, <clears throat> christened. So uh, yeah. So my wife said, "Oh, I need a new outfit for the christening." And I said, "Yeah, of course you do. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah." So she said, "So we need to go shopping." So I kind of said, hang on, where's this transference of ownership? If you need an outfit, why do we need to go shopping? Seemed odd to me, <clears throat> but she said, I value your opinion. I can assure you this is not true. Uh, but anyway, um, um, I was encouraged, shall we say, that I needed to give up a valuable Saturday when there were much more useful things to do to go physically shopping in Cardiff. Now, I think, I don't know what you think about this, um, Cardiff people, you might as well just go to John Lewis, don't you think? John Lewis got everything really. So uh, we went to Jan Lewis in the Cardiff Centre, first of all, and she went to this first concession. And uh, uh, she grabbed, she likes this make, so she grabbed a few things on hangers. I'm going to try these on. I went, great. So I sat on the bench outside with the other sad men trying to get a signal on our phone so we could see what was happening in the sporting world, you know. And um, she came out wearing one of the outfits. She said, I didn't like the others. I said, all right. She said, I, but I like this one. I said, oh, great. She said, um, she said, what do you think of it? Well, I said, well, I love it. I think it's fantastic. Now, I've been married a long time. I said, I expect cynicism kicks in after a while, you know. Uh, <laughs> so she said, yeah, yeah, but you might just be saying that because you'd rather not be here, wouldn't you? I went, well, yeah, there is an element of that. <clears throat> but um, I'm not going to waste our money. Um, so that would be doubt. And I, I do like it. So I thought I got it. What do you think? And she said, well, I really like it. I said, great, <laughs> job done, let's go home. And she said, no, we can't do that. And I said, can we not? She said, no. I said, well, so what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna do is ask the sales assistant if they'll kindly reserve this till close of play and we can try some lots more other things on. And I went, oh, good. And we did for two hours. <laughs> and at the end of about two hours, she said, no, I'm happy now. I'm." Uh, I, 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 I do realise the first outfit was the one that I'm going to go back and buy. Now, I, you could say that those two hours are a waste of time. I may, if I'm honest, I may have mentioned this several times walking back to the first concession. But I don't suppose it was really. It was validating that, that the requirement was being met within the original time constraints that we set. You know, the shop was still open. And as we walk back to the first concession, she said, you know, and you know, when I came out today, I, th I thought I'd need to buy some shoes. But I don't need shoes. I've got shoes that go well with that. And I said, fabulous, fantastic. We saved some money. She said, well, not really, because there was a top over there I quite liked as well. So I'm going to buy that instead. So the requirement changed, but still are arguably within the original parameters. And, and that's, that, that's, that, that should be OK, shouldn't it? We should be able to deal with that. And, you know, we, we need to take the pressure off the customer knowing precisely what they want. You know, for example, if you go out to a restaurant, you know, um, you don't generally know precisely what you want to eat. You make a kind of strategic decision that you want to go for a vegetarian meal, a Chinese meal, Italian meal or a, or a steak meal or whatever. You know, you, you, you generally have, you know, cost constraints to work with. Maybe you've got a taxi book for 10 o'clock as well. You know, if the guy at the door says, if you don't tell me what you want to eat, I can't serve you, then that would be bonkers because you would say, hang on, 
what I want to do. I want to look at the menu. I want to see what's possible. I want to talk uh, to a technical expert, let's call him the head waiter, who can advise me on the specials. Um, I might look to see what other people are eating. Uh, I definitely don't want to start. I don't want to choose my dessert yet. I don't know if I want one yet. Can I leave that decision till later? And they should say, coming in. Coming in. And that's what we should try to encourage because you know, this is this is difficult because you're expecting the customer to know exactly what they want. And to be honest, I can tell you what every customer and every solution wants right from the outset. It's quite simple. They want everything. They want everything. If you say to a customer, what do you want? Oh, we want everything. Don't we? we want it's I don't know. It's a bit like having maybe my kids were greedier than others, but my kids are married now. But when they were little, about September time, I would say to them, what do you want for Christmas, kids? And they always gave me the Argos catalogue. And every toy on every page was marked up. Bill Bailey, the comedian, calls the Argos catalogue the laminated book of dreams, which I think is wonderful. It's Smith Superstores now, I believe. And, and I remember saying to my kids, you, if you had that, you would never play with it. Oh, if we had that, we would play with it every day, Dad. I know we would. No, you wouldn't. It's just, it's not important. And why do you want that? Well, everybody else is having that. If we don't, okay. Why would you want that and that? Well, if we didn't, they're, 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 they're different. They're not, they're the same. And so I used to say to my kids, Father Christmas has to prioritize. And they would say, it doesn't say that on the tally, but I mean, there has to, we do have to get people to prioritize their requirements because otherwise you end up with lots of time down here built up in, or based around dubious functionality. And to be honest, it's not the customer's fault that they, they want everything. It's because they know, or they've come to learn over the years, if they don't put in the specification, they ain't going to get it. And nobody wants to be blamed for leaving things out. So let's put it in a spec. Do you think that'll be useful in a two years time? Don't know, might be, put it in a spec. Do you think that will be something which might be, oh, I don't know, could be, put it in a spec. And so we're trying to move away from that by getting people to prioritize. And it's one of the biggest stumbling blocks in, in introducing agile approaches is getting people to realize that prior, they don't need everything and they certainly don't need everything now. The prioritization is important. And people, the number of senior leaders have said to me, yeah, I like all this stuff, it's good, but you have to realize everything here is mandatory. It's really not, you just think it is. It's really not, you just think it is, you know. Um, a good example is in your kitchen or in your utility area. I'm guessing we've all got washing machines of some type in there. For the men amongst us, it's where dirty clothes go in. There's like a glass hole in the middle. Clean clothes come out. Um, how many? Can someone tell me how many programs are on their washing machine? One. <laughs> one. Just put it on the same one. Ah, I didn't one. ask you how many you use. I asked you how many are on the wheel. <laughs> We, and the answer is you don't know, do you, probably? But there's probably 12, 15, who knows, who knows? But, you know, in, in answer to how many do you use, two maybe, 30 degrees, 40 degrees? Yeah, yeah. But when you bought it, the guy went, no, this one, it's got this feature, that for you. Whoa, I want that. I can't live without it, you know? And and so you have to prioritize. And, you know, and people people don't always see it. I was, I've been working with um, a French company. Uh, you, you may have come across them, Paul, in the, in the military, Talis. They're spelt Thales. And, you know, I work with um, people who work, people in their area who get involved in battleship design uh, and battleship construction. And, and someone there, an engineer told me, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't prioritize a battleship. I said, of course you can. He said, you can't put half the hull in the water and sink. So now you've got to think differently. You know, you put the basic hull and the basic um, weaponry and radar equipment on it. And then you can use it to do whatever you want to do with a battleship. And then you can add extra weaponry and extra um, sophisticated equipment while you're getting the use of it. And he said, I've never thought of it in that way. And the answer is, yeah, it's very unusual not to be able to prioritize. You know, if you're building a block of student flats, generally, you know, you'd start from the ground up. So you can lease out the ground floor for the Starbucks and all that kind of stuff while you're still constructing above. There's generally ways of doing it if you if you have a mind if you need to get some early revenues. And a good example of this 
imagine again, let's talk about going on holiday again. Imagine we, for some arbitrary reason, we, we decided we wanted to go and buy a camera to take pictures of, on our holiday or in a wedding or whatever. You know, and if you think about the features that a camera have, there are various things it must have. You know, I mean, all it really must do is take pictures. You know, if you go to a camera shop to Jessup's, I don't know if they still exist, do they? But if you go there and you say, I want to buy a picture, I want to buy a camera, and the guy goes, here's one. He's here, all oh, right, does it take pictures? He goes, nah, not really. So, well, no, no point buying that, is there really? But you could buy that for two pounds. It's one of those silly disposables you buy at the tills of WH Smith when you go on a night out. But it's not very good, is it? It's not going to be really useful because there are a certain number of features which it should have. I mean, I would imagine it should store pictures. So it's now digital. Um, <clears throat> uh, a zoom would be a good thing, if possible. And maybe a flash so you could work in low light conditions. I, I suspect, but I don't know. I suspect you could probably buy that for 50 pounds. But you could get carried away, couldn't you? I mean, there are various things it could have. It could have exchangeable lenses, so it becomes an SLR. It could have manual overrides. Uh, it could be waterproof, so it's a GoPro. GoPro. Uh, GPS. Uh, whew, tripod. Oh, quite useful, isn't it? You know, um, it could make coffee. Perhaps a bit too far coffee. But what tends to happen is you get carried away with bells and whistles, you know, at the expense of basic functionality. And this easily happens, you know. Um, I, I'm not allowed to go and look at Hi-Fi on my own because I will go into a Hi-Fi stop. There's a particularly good one uh, in Cruise Road in Cardiff. And if I go in there just to browse, I'll come out having spent far too much money on a good, on something which I didn't know existed 10 minutes ago. You know, so, you know, and we do it all the time because you get carried away in bells and whistles. I know and what, what you'd easily lose sight of if you actually played with it, it'd be quite good if it had a screen that you could look through. It would be quite good if it had a battery, wouldn't it? That had some light. Maybe a charger should be with it. And, and you tend to forget bases at the expense of shiny, shiny things. You know? And, and the point about all this is this costs as much as you want it to cost, really. And it's really easy to lose sight of your basic objectives that you wanted a camera within a certain price limit within a certain time scale. You know? and, and the other thing I've done here is I, I haven't defined a requirement at all. Camera is a solution. Unless you're into amateur photography or if you do it, which you may be, forgive me for not knowing, I don't know about you, I can't, I've got a digital Ixus somewhere, but I can't remember where it is. Because I, when, when I'm on holiday, when I'm going to weddings and christenings, I've got an iPhone it, and the cameras are brilliant. They do as much as I want, but it's very easy to, to, to reach for a solution without thinking about what the requirement is. And I've got a good example of this. A friend of mine, she was advising a public sector group in mid Wales. And she said to me a few years ago, I said, they think they want iPhones. And I said, they don't want iPhones, do they? She said, they think they do. And I said, they, they, you know what they haven't got in mid-Wales? Anyone would be in mid-Wales? They ain't got no signals. <laughs> they would have been completely redundant. And she asked them why they wanted iPhones. They went, oh, they're the future. You know, said, yeah, no, they're not, because there's no signals. You, you, need, you need better comms. What you want are radios, <laughs> you know? So, you know, we've got to get people thinking. And here's something else here. Here's something else here. Imagine we bought this. So we did buy this camera for 50 quid, which does most of what we want. I would say that does 80% of what, what we want. Let's just then say we became a sophisticated user. We call it changing persona, if you want to be posy. We, we start to use that camera and we realize the limitations. We say, well, now that we've got that, we wish we'd got a waterproof one. That would have been really good when we were paddleboarding or whatever. Um, it would have been great if we got one with exchangeable lenses and GPS. The problem is you can't bolt it on, can you? You're stuck with what you got. So what you may have to acknowledge was that that was good enough for our initial requirement and actually led us to understand what we really wanted 
So we might now discard that and move towards that. And a cynical person would say you wasted 50 quid. And a more, more, more pragmatic person would say, no, you didn't. What you did is you met the immediate business need and you use that feature, that, that solution, to understand what you really wanted. And it's that kind of thinking we've got to get into. Yeah. And um, I'm sorry, uh, Yara and Oles, and I, I heard the words being used. This for many years has been kicking around from the 70s, has been known as applying Moscow rules. I'll be honest with you, for the obvious reason right now, we're all trying to think of another name for this. The industry is actually trying to think of another name because no one wants to have Moscow rules, I understand. And, 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 and what Moscow stands for, must, should, could, won't now, maybe later. Must, should, could, won't now. And people say, well, you only really have to deliver the musts. But really, shoulds are called shoulds for their reason because they're... So they, 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 that makes it a good product. And it, it's, it's basically what we often call the 80-20 rule. I don't know if you've come across also being called the Pareto principle. Pareto said it was a, was a philosopher and he basically said 20% of the people have got 80% of the money and vice versa. That can't be right. But if the, the, the thinking here is if we can satisfy 80% of the solution with doing 20% of the work, that's a good thing to do. So... One more thing before lunch, I know that. Um, I want to just try to introduce, if I can, the main concepts, the main concepts of an agile life cycle, which should overcome my admittedly exaggerated um, constraint with the traditional approach. This is actually chapter six of the manual, but I, but I wouldn't worry about it right now. Um, but I really want to make sure you're up to this. Can we can we just reconvene at midday just to take this through to lunch? So if we could have a short break till 12 o'clock and we'll take you through the basic of, uh, of the Agile life cycle. See you at 12. Hello, hello. Back in the room. It's like a fast show, isn't it? You're back in the room. So uh, all I want to do is we lead up towards lunch. So thanks for sticking with me this morning. Um, uh, big pictures today, getting you thinking about the basic ideas. Uh, hopefully Paul saw that about the traditional approach as well. Um, just want to get you thinking about the basic agile life cycle. So a lot of the main concepts that we're going to discuss over the next couple of days are actually in this session. So um, we'll build on this later on, but this is just to take us up to lunch. Again, I was thinking about the main aspects of an agile approach. So um, <clears throat> it is chapter six, but I wouldn't worry about that yet. So uh, three projects. Well, th th there's there's no th we haven't decided whether it's even worth bothering with yet. But we should have we generally find ourselves as that a sponsor puts together some form of terms of reference document, which oh, yeah. defines the drivers for any potential project. In other words, is it a compliance project, perhaps? Sorry, then can I ask you? Yeah. Um, about Moscow, uh, M must, S should, uh, C could, and W, what, what means W? Won't, won't now, won't now. Won't, won't now, okay. Won't, will not now, yeah. Okay, thank you. So the sponsor just sort of defines what, you know, what the potential drivers are. Now, it could be a compliance project. We've got to tie in with new legislation. It could be, you know, a, 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 a revenue, revenue enhancing project. We want to make some sales. It could be an efficiency project. We want to reduce costs and so on. But this is just pre-project from the sponsor. Oh, no, no real work here. It's like a corporate mandate. Then we move into, if we're going to do it, we go into feasibility. This is very much a short, sharp exercise um, where we ask ourselves two questions, really. Firstly, as the name implies, is there a feasible or vi viable, call it what you like, really, opportunity? In other words, is this something which should generate some value? Can we afford it? Is it strategically aligned and so on? Or is it risky? How long would it take? 
So what we put together here is what we call an outline business case. Again, more of this coming, but this is just starting to give us some ballpark figures and purely ballpark, uh, if I could use that expression, on, on likely costs could be between 50 and 100 grand, time scales could be three to six months, benefits could increase sales by 20 to 30%. Very much, if I can use the expression finger in the air, just an outline business case. And this, also what we do at this point is consider if we're going to go for it, is Agile the right way? Is Agile the right approach? So what we should do is challenge the use of Agile right from the outset. And I am finding that this isn't happening, is it? Thou shalt be agile seems to have become the new mantra. Uh, everyone is trying to be agile, even in circumstances when it's not, not the best way of going for, about it. And we really need to think about whether agile is a reasonable way of taking our full project forward. And if, if it has already been mandated that thou shalt be agile, how do we make agile work here? And we've got, we've got tools which will help us do that. So again, bear with me on that. And then we make a decision based on those two discussions. So firstly, is it, is it feasible? Is it viable? And is Agile the right way? And, and we will progress to the next phase if the answer to both of those questions is yes. And the next phase is really important. It's called the foundations phase. In some areas of the um, public sector, it's known as the discovery phase, but the, the name that we give to it is the foundations of space. And the best way of thinking of this is kind of set up, set it up as a project and scope it. That's not what it says in the book, these are just my words. And so what we would produce here, through, through discussion, through interview, through fact finding, is some high level, well, we're going to call them products in due case. So a high level list of requirements which are prioritized. This is our prioritized, excuse the shorthand here, if you will, requirements list. This is what um, Scrum people you mentioned would call a product backlog. We call it the prioritized requirements list. And we also produce a high level delivery plan which should take us through the whole timeline, timeline of the project, but in a very high level way, just, to, just showing the direction of travel. We, we also should think about what I'm just gonna call for now governance. Governance is really talking about how we're gonna attack various aspects of the solution. So we need to think about who is gonna do what in this project. Who's going to be the sponsor? Who's going to be the project manager? Who's going to be the, uh, the visionary and so on? And how we're going to manage and control it. So one of the things we should think about is how we're going to manage this as a project. We should also think about how we're going to move towards the final solution. So we should start to think about documenting the solution. Again, very high level. I'll be more precise on these. And we should also define how we're going to build and test it. In other words, how we're going to develop it. So this is all part of our full project life cycle. Now, because we've learned a lot more about the project, we think we ought to revisit our business case and we should come up with a full business case at this point, a full business case. So much clearer indication of cost, timescales, risks and benefits. And once again, because we know more about what we're going to do, we ought to check again that Agile is still the right approach. So we're keeping an eye on that all the way through. So this shouldn't take too long. We don't believe that this area here should last more than about 10 or 15% of the overall time scale of the project because we don't want to be over analytical, but we do want to set the scene before 
we move into what we call evolutionary development. And, and through evolutionary development, good. Through evolutionary development, what we do is we take a subset of our requirements. So we take some of these and we explore the detail and engineer the solution. So Lee and anyone else into Scrum, this is about establishing our sprint backlog that we're going to explore the detail on. So we, we think through what we're doing here, we'll end up the, with the right solution and get the solution right. A second from there, okay, fine. And then we deploy, which is our word for going live or possibly going live. And when we finish deploying, we're in post project. Just about to see that swing, but you just do something. Okay. And people often say to me, well, not sure about this, mate. It looks exactly the same, or pretty much the same as what you described in the waterfall approach except that you're not bothering to test. And the answer is, well, we are bothering to test. We're testing all the way through. Although we don't have a different uh, a testing phase per se, we're reviewing, inspecting, and testing all the way through. Because one of the problems we see with the traditional approach is testing is often left late in the life cycle. So we have an ongoing review, inspection, and test as we go. But the big deal really is what happens in here because instead of the customer having to express exactly what we want up front, what we, in a specification, what we are suggesting is that the detailed requirement, excuse the shorthand if you will, and the solution evolve, some people say emerge, but we usually use the word evolve through two important ideas. And I just want to introduce these if I can. Iterative development and incremental delivery, incremental delivery. And all I want to do is just to outline these leading up to lunch if I can. And you'll find that these important concepts that are applied in all agile approaches, really, iterative development. So we don't need the customer to define exactly what they want. It will emerge. It will evolve through what we're doing here, through models, prototypes, and so on. So iterative development, what does that mean? Well, what it means is it's unlikely to, you're unlikely to get something right first time. So the way to get something right and some way to take something from a high level to a more detailed level is to expose it to review, <laughs> to continuous verification and improvement. Yeah. So uh, let me let me just run an example by you. I'll keep away from IT because Agile PM, although it lends itself nicely to an IT environment, is nothing to do with Agile. Imagine if you will. Imagine if you were will. You were watching the TV last night. Whatever Sunday night nonsense is on TV. And um, your other half comes in and brings you a cup of coffee and uh, some biscuits. Oh, that's very nice of you. Thank you for that. He said, you're all right. Said, well, no, not really. He said, that, the kitchen's rubbish, isn't it? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I said, um, I, I just... Um, I just uh, um, made a cup of coffee. Uh, one of the one of the wall plugs isn't working. I have to go to another socket for the for the kit for the kettle. And I, you know, I just got the biscuit barrel out of the cupboard. And the bloody door fell off. You go, yeah, it is a bit past his best. And he say, funny enough, I was trying to cook uh, something in the oven last week, and uh, one side of the oven is hotter than the other, and one of the one of the gas hobs doesn't work anymore. And I noticed a couple of you know, it's just 
it's been a long time since we put that kitchen in, isn't it? We give you a house. We said, you know what, we could inst- we could have a change here. Why don't we why don't we get a new kitchen installed? Sure, well, we could do, can we? You say, right, yeah, we could do. I don't know. We haven't been away on holiday for a bit because of COVID and all that. We've got a bit of money in the bank. How much do you reckon we can afford? You said, well, I don't know. What about, I know nothing about kitchens, by the way. What about 10K? Who can get something for that? Well, I don't know. Well, what do you think we'd need? And you say, well, let's make a list. We'd need cupboards. Yeah. We need worktops. We need uh, an oven and a hob. Yeah. And... Um, what else would we need? We need a fridge or a fridge and a freezer. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's see what could be done then. So you go along to a fitting uh, fitter and, and you say, um, can you do that? And he looks at it and goes, well, that's what people do when they're sizing up a job. Don't they? So oh, I could do a nice kitchen for that. Go, yeah, I could do a nice one for that. It's all right. Oh, well, that's worth knowing. He said, yeah, take about a week's work, mind. So well, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. But you can definitely, oh, yeah, we could do that. Yeah. yeah loads of kitchens like that and have a look at their website if you like he said right well i think you know he seemed very confident i'll give you the job so i can leave it to you can i well you know he said you could do i mean he said because don't forget um while while we're working on your kitchen you won't be able to cook any meals you'll have to either eat out or something he said right well i tell you what um could you do it in three weeks time because we've got a we've got a holiday booked in bluestone in pembrokeshire we're going to take the grandkids down there so we're away for a week can I, could I, would you come in then and do it? He said, let me have a look at my schedules. Yeah, I can do it then. Well, fantastic. He says, you won't be in my way. By the time you come back, you'll have a lovely new kitchen. And, oh, fantastic. So you hand over control to, to the technical guy, really, which is a bit dangerous, as you'll see in a minute. And, um, but that's what we do in the traditional approach, don't we? We hand over control to the technical guy. So um, anyway, you go off to Bluestone for a week and the guy comes in and you're driving back up the M4, um, uh, hoping that he's ready. And when, when you get outside your property, your house, fair play, the, the kitchen man is standing outside looking very proud with himself, a little chest puffed out, you know. And he said, have you finished? He went, oh, yeah, it was a bit more work than we thought, but we got it done. We finished it about an hour ago. He goes, oh, brilliant, brilliant. He said, we think it's a great bit of, we love it. We think it's going to be really good. We want to take photographs. Yeah, yeah, if you like, that's fine. So come and have a look. And he opens the kitchen door. I might be treading on toes here. I've got to be careful. And he goes, whoa, green cupboard doors. He said, now, they were 30% discount. We got you a deal on those so we could put a few more cupboards in. So, mate, I'm not being funny, but I don't like green cupboard doors. I was thinking of a sort of pale oak sort of setup, you know, something blonde and light. He said, oh, well, to, to be honest, you, you didn't say that. We thought that was good. And... Uh, and you, and you say, and you put black granite worktops on top? He said, yeah, they go nice with the green doors, don't they? I said, yeah, I know, but I don't like the green doors. Ooh. So it was a bit tricky now. They've all been cut to size. You know, they've all been fitted. Can't really take them off now. You know, what you'd said. And, and you say, hang on, I can see. You put the fridge next to the oven. He said, right, now uh, that was our electrician's idea. He said, technically, that was good because... By putting them together, we saved a load of cable and we also didn't have to chase out the plaster around to the other side of the kitchen. So um, that saved a fair bit of work, technically. And again, you know, that we that was a good idea. Well, it might be a good idea technically, but it's not a great idea operationally. So what do you mean? He said, well, oven hot, fridge cold. Yeah. So the fridge is going to click on more, more, more frequently if it was somewhere else because it's in a hot area. So you've increased my, my electric bills and goodness knows they're enough as it is. And also it's going to wear out quicker. And, you know, you, that's just not a great idea operationally. And you say, well, and he says, well, to be honest, you pushed off down on all day, didn't you? You left it all to us. I mean, we could take it all out and start again. But I mean, basically, I think you'll find we did what you specified. And, and that's what happens in a traditional approach, isn't it? You hand over control till the end. And that's stupid, isn't it? It's dull. Because surely what you would do, how about this? Let's take an iterative approach. You go along to your kitchen fit and say, look, we've got 10K, mate. These are the sort of things we were thinking of. Guy goes, yeah, do something like that. Hang on, bear with me. Bear with me. We're finally the expert here. Um, have you, where's, the kitchen, where's the window in your kitchen? Oh, the window's on the back wall. So, right. 
what do you think about then? You know, if you're going to be preparing vegetables and so on, what about if we put the uh, the basin and the draining board in front of the window so you could look at? Oh, that sounds a great idea. So it's fantastic. Okay, that's a good starting point. Have you got mains gas or are you in a rural area? No, we've got mains gas. Okay, do you know where your gas point comes in? Because that's a bit of a constraint, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Well, the gas point comes in there. So it's okay. So that's obviously a good point for the oven and the hob. And we could put some more units around there. Um, I think we could put a number of units there within your budget. Um, do you want a fridge or do you want a fridge and a freezer? Oh, I think we'll have a fridge freezer. But what if we put that here? Yeah, it looks good. And you say, well, there's some, there's some initial thought for you. And you say, right, thank you very much. And I don't want to make a decision on my own. My partner will need to buy into this as well. So oh, no problem. Take it home and have a think about it and come back and see me. So you go back and you see your partner. And your partner says, oh, we'd like to look at that. And it's all very, but, you know, I think the fridge would be better there. And maybe we could switch positions of the, of the draining board and the basin. So, okay, well, we can do that. And what about the cover scheme? We haven't mentioned that yet. So you go back to, you go back to the kitchen man and you say, we like it, but um, we've got a couple of ideas. He says, right, no problem. What I've got is a little modeling tool in my Mac. What I can do, now we're on the right lines. Now we've done that initial investigation. I can, I can feed these units into the, uh, into the modeling tool and um, I can give you a more accurate representation um, and I can um, and I can show you some color schemes on it. What I'll do is I'll email it to you and you can walk around your kitchen tonight on your iPad and see if you feel like it. Fantastic. So he does that, you get home and uh, you're walking around the kitchen and your other half and you say, well, you know what? I think the fridge was better before where it was. So should we ask him if he can revert to the previous version of that and maybe put those things where they were before? And they go, yeah, it's not a problem, is it? Because we're not moving real things. It's just on a model. It's just on software. We're not moving real units. And ask him if um, if he can come up with slightly lighter doors and the handles he's put on. I don't like the look of those. Can he got other handles? So you go back and you say, we like it. And he says, good. But can we make some changes? Can we revert to the previous version? He goes, yeah, no problem. Because he's just changing. And can you show us some lighter doors? He goes, yeah, what about these? We don't like the handles. OK, we can change those. What do you think about those? And you go back and forth, back and forth until you get to the right solution, which leads you to the solution being right. But what is the problem with all that back and forth? Is it a problem? What do you think? What do you reckon? There is a problem. What is it? One word. Confusing. Well, we should be actually clarifying things rather than confusing, shouldn't we? But yeah, because time. Could, time is a big deal, isn't it, really? People like to... People like to um, like to go on and on. You can always feel, you can always tinker with things, can't you? So you, there has to be a point where you fix on something. So we have to we have to set time constraints on this on this development. And this is what we in our world called called splitting our project up into a time box. It's what Scrum people would call a sprint. So you know they all relate to each other. A time box. And what we say is we'll set a time box for doing this work pretty tight, to be honest. Let's say between two to four weeks, which should be long enough to produce something of value. Something of value. Okay. And at the beginning of the time box, we have to think as a team, I'm going to be more precise what I mean when I use these words team and project and so on. We have to be more precise about what we can achieve in that. So the project manager would talk to the solution development team about what is achievable in let's say four weeks. Yeah. And he or she would come in with a list of potential requirements that they want them to work on. Now, the thing is, they can't all be musts. Because if everything is a must and we hit a snag, it's going to affect our timely delivery. So we always, coming into a time box, there's always a combination of musts, shoulds and coulds. And generally, we work on the 80-20 rule. But you also see people talking about 60, 20, 20 in the manual. Yeah. 
So nothing is ever all must. That's quite an important idea. Now, the team hold an event, a meeting, if you like, which we call a kickoff. This is where the, it's like accepting a work pack. Olis. Okay, and what we're doing with uh, W, with, it's Moscow, as I understand. Yes? Yeah, won't now, Olis. Won't, won't now. now. We just want now. It's... Yeah, we, we, we won't worry about that for the time being. We'll get there. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So the team look at this, and there is an element of discussion, negotiation with the project manager. And the idea is they should make sure that they've got something they believe they can realistically achieve. Sorry, I've got too many C's in my real achieve. So the team, so the project manager might go, oh, and they go, well, I don't think we can do all that. We can do. It. So there is a discussion here, which is a kickoff event with the team. And then once the team say, yeah, we can, we think we can do that, we can do that. We've got the resources to do it. We know what you want. Leave it to us. We will now explore the detail of those requirements through iterative development. And you, and you can leave it to us. And the project manager backs off, lets the team get on with it. The team are now, in, uh, the team are now uh, empowered to develop the detailed requirement and the solution to meet that high level requirement. <coughs> But what the project manager would be doing is keep a watch to make sure the team are working as a team and so on. And what she or he would ask the team to do would be to run what we call daily stand-ups. The, these are the equivalent, these are the equivalent of a, uh, uh, of a, of a, of a scrum in, in Scrum, for those who do Scrum, daily stand-ups. These should be held the same time, same place every day. Ideally, the whole team should attend, but if they can't, um, uh, then we, we'll still hold the, the stand up anyway. And if they can attend using technology, Zoom, Teams, wherever, that's fine too. And the stand up should be short and sweet. We use the name stand up because it means like the Privy Council don't sit down. It stops people getting, they become too much of an institutionalized meeting. And basically each member of the team says, this is what I've done since yesterday. This is what I'm going to do today. These are the obstacles or impediments which are in my way. And the team leader and project manager try to get rid of the obstacles. That's the idea of it. That's the absolute idea. And we generally run these in front of a team board. And the key aspect of a team board at this point would be some form of burn down chart. You'll find these described on page 198 of the manual. And basically, the burn down chart says here is the work outstanding at this point. Not tasks, but work. Here is the timeline of the time box. And the idea is we, we define our predicted rate of delivery. And the idea is that any one stand up, any one stand up, we should know whether we're behind schedule Excuse me one moment. Sorry. Right, so the idea is that anyone stand up, we should know whether we're behind schedule, ahead of schedule on track and so on. And so the idea is, if we notice this, it gives the, op the team the opportunity to reorganize and replan. So the team are in, in control of their own plan. They're planning their work and they make adjustments. 
Yeah? And it's just a device for getting early warning of, of falling behind schedule so that we reorganize. I've done this, I'm supposed to be doing this, um, but I'm not getting a reply off Fred. I'll get Fred to reply to you. I've done this, I'm supposed to be doing this, but my boss has called me out to a meeting outside the team and I don't think I can get out of it. Okay, we'll help with that task. So this is how it works. So the team will have produced their time box plan. So they plan their own work at a detailed level and the project manager just keeps a, keeps a watching eye on it just to make sure the team are collaborating, that they are working a team and they're holding daily standups. And generally, something like a burn down chart, you can use other things as well if you want to, is a good way of recognizing when we're behind schedule as early as possible. We'll talk more about standups tomorrow. Hollis. Uh, Tony, how we can work task, tasks in work? Because as I understand, MS, MS work, is work, tasks. Work, work breaks down into tasks. The work to create a website break, may well break down into number of tasks. Use the word work. Because they ask you that in the exam. What, what is the vertical axis of a burn down chart? It's work outstanding. But how understand how is to made the measurement of work? We have well, you can work. So we will talk about that. You can you can measure in point in story points, in hours, in days. There are different ways to measure. We'll talk about measuring. But but, but what we discussed previously with the team uh, that yeah. we Yeah, yeah, it's all agreed with the team up front. It's every day or uh, when we establish new time box? When, when you establish in the time box, you would split this, how much work is involved in each requirement. We'll, we'll, we'll do it tomorrow. Okay. And, so, and uh, reorganize and replan in daily manner. Uh, we need to reorganize and replan according to daily, uh, this daily, daily basis. Thing. Yeah. So if they ask you how frequently does the time box plan get updated, it's on a daily basis through the standard. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. So this is how it progresses. And we would hope that the team are moving towards the eventual solution. But what could happen, what could happen at any point, let's just say here, is the team realize they're not gonna make it. They're not gonna be able to achieve everything that they set out to do. So what are we gonna do? We've hit a snag. So in a traditional approach, Okay, we've got a fixed scope, fixed quality. We have time and cost defined too. <coughs> the traditional approach is to say, okay, time will have to extend to deliver everything. The, the agile world says no. The agile world says no, once we fix the time, we will stick to it. Okay, knee jerk reaction. Put some more people into the team. Yeah. IT used to be famous for this for a long time. Throw computer programmers at it. Yeah. Um, of course, that, that increases that increases costs as well. So we say, no, you can't do that for two reasons. One is it increased costs. And, and also, if you've got a team which is working well, if you've got a team which is working well, if you introduce a new person into it, it doesn't speed you up at all. It slows you down because you've got to bring that person up to speed and so on. What we could do is reduce quality, re reduce time spent on testing, inspection and review. And, and we say that's not a good idea either. So there's only one parameter, if you like, left to play with, which is scope, which is scope. And the team are authorized to take out votes. Worst case, they're even authorized to, to take out shoots. But we guarantee at least the mass. So the team have that authority without going up the chain. And it lends itself to a very cynical view that you only intended to deliver the mass. Well, that's not true. When we're planning, we plan, we tend, we intend to deliver everything. But if push comes to shove, our contingency, if you like, is in coulds and possibly shoulds. And then people say, okay, what about the things we've lost? Have we lost them forever? And the answer is no, you haven't. 
because at the end of a time box, we have another event which we call a closeout. A closeout, which has two aspects to it. Firstly, a review of what's been done and what's not been done. Raphael. Raphael? Uh, sorry. Uh, I just would like to know if he, the the shoe then codes they are approached uh, the foundation phase or during yeah. the evolutionary development? Oh, like... they're, they're, they're established in foundation. These are the parameters within which the team works. Uh, okay. okay. So the priority, good question. Oh, thank you. The prioritized requirements list is must, should, goods, want. So we're taking a subset into that. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, the team review what's done. Oh, I've got some more hands up now. Yes. How can I do more kind? Of Ola? Uh, Ola sure. And we uh, choose mass shoot and code uh, only one time during the project or every time we decide no, to during time, time boxes? They can change. But once we, the team can't change the priorities once we're in a time box. The, the priorities are set at a, at a project level. But at the end of a time box, we would have to see what happens to the things we didn't deliver. Bear, bear with me, I'll come on to that. Yeah. So firstly, we have a review and the thing we have to think about reprioritizing the thing, the, the items which fell out of the time box. And we also have a, what we call a retro, retrospective. Where we look back at our behaviors and say, how well did the team do? How well did the team do? Did we have the right skills? Did we collaborate? Did we cooperate? Um, how can we improve our behaviors next time? Maybe we were over optimistic about what we could achieve and so on. So this is important. The review of what's done and what's not been done and the retrospective looking at behaviors. Yeah, and that's how it works. And, 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 and the team have this authority to ditch must sorry, shoulds and coulds. We'd rather hope they didn't, dis didn't discard shoulds, but they are focusing on the main areas. But we do plan to deliver 100% of the work. Okay, um, so this means that we can guarantee timely delivery. That's the main thing there. And, and people get confused between the idea, the difference between priority and business criticality. Because it's a must or a should or a could, we, we, you know, the traditional approach is we'll deliver all the musts and then the shoulds and coulds will follow. We quite often implement a, a should or a could before a must. So no time box is all must. Is all must. Because if everything is a must, how are we going to deal with problems and issues which arise? Because we do guarantee to deliver on time. We do guarantee to deliver on time. And I, I'll give you an example. Paul. Oh, I would have waited until you finished your, that sentence. If you, uh, okay. but what I was going to say was, um, so are you saying that we have, we have to wait until the end of the time box before, so on the daily stand-ups, you don't adjust within the time box. You have to wait until the end of the time box before no. you make that decision. We adjust the plan, but we try to deliver everything. But at the end of the time box, things which have fallen by the wayside, we need to reconsider what we're going to do about them. Yeah. So, okay. but yeah, we start to think about that as soon as you recognize that's going to happen, to be honest. But there is a formal review event. But we could, we could easily implement a must or a should before, a uh, should or a could be for let me Let me give you an example. Um, a few years ago, I worked with a, a big financial products market uh, company in Surrey. And they, they decided to switch all the sales of their financial products online. Okay, so they, they had a whole, whole re series of things. Um, they had ISAs, they had um, pet insurance, host contents insurance, all sorts of stuff. But their core business was selling people car insurance. That was their core business. That's where they made most of their money from. Yeah, so they wanted to switch this to an online platform. So if you're um, if you're selling uh, people car insurance today, which is what is it? Where are we now? The fifth of June. You know, basically, you need to collect various pieces of information so that you can you can sell car insurance. 
and and there is a, there is a feature which you must have on your website around about next April or May. What what we, what must your customer be able to do once you've sold them car insurance today in May? Let's say May two thousand and twenty four. Need to renew. They need to renew. Absolutely. Otherwise, you're going to go bust. So that's a must. Agreed. But it wasn't an immediate must. So what they did, I won't tell you who they are. When they went live with their initial system, they went live with a system which could sell people car insurance, but there was no renewal function. But what they what they thought there was more value in was asking them questions about pet insurance, home insurance, personal insurance as well, because we're driving by value. So if you think about where the immediate value was, they decided it was more, it was preferable to get the basic sales function out there and also collect information about pets and host and contents insurance, safe in the knowledge that they could build the renewal function within the next nine months. So that, that blows people's minds sometimes that you may well introduce or go live with a should or a could before a must because it's because we're driven on, on driving on value. Whereas in a traditional approach, you'd have all your musts and your shoulds and coulds to follow on. But what's the point of putting the renewal function in if you know it's not going to be necessary for nine months? So it was a must in the project, but not an immediate must. So you often implement a should or a could before a must. Again, if you look at the must, you, you, if you're telling someone car insurance, you must collect their age, their driving history, their postcode, and the car that they're going to drive, and you can give them a quote. Later on, you could add on more sophistication. You I mean you could collect information about the number of miles they drive, whether they're driving in rural areas, extras, and so on. So a must can have shoulds and coulds in it. So it can get quite complicated, this. Because again, you could implement a basic solution and add on more sophistication later so you can improve it. So a must can have shoulds and coulds in it. And also just to really blow your mind as we're almost towards lunch, a could could have a must in it. Here's an example. See this really expensive Mont Blanc pen? 200 quid that is. Tell you 200 quid now, it's a 5p biro, yeah? If you look at that pen, there are things it must have. It must have ink, mustn't it? Otherwise, no good. It must have a nib to dispense the ink. Um, I think it should have a barrel. It's hard writing if you haven't got a barrel, isn't it? So there's your must and your should. That works now. What could it have so it doesn't make a best on your hands like mine are now, or in your bag or in your pocket? What could it have? What could it have? Oh, it could have a lid. It? it could have a lid yeah. like that, couldn't it? Agree? Agree that's a could? Not essential, nice to have. But if you do put that on for health and safety compliance reasons, what must it have in each end? The answer is a hole. So otherwise children and pets um, choke. So it gets a bit more complicated, isn't it? Because a could could have a must in it. So we have to think about all these kind of things, really. So, uh, but the important thing about where we are now is that the team works within agreed parameters. So they can't change those. They can't decide that a must is not a must. They should plan to deliver everything. They adjust the plan as they go forward in standards. But if, if, if they get into trouble, they can discard coulds and maybe shoulds. So here's an important thing here. Reduction in scope is not seen as reduction in quality in Agile. You know, if we if we say um, the camera is going to have a zoom, which is three times digital. That's quality. If we decide not to deliver the zoom feature, that isn't reduced, reducing quality to us. That's a scope reduction. And that's quite an important idea. More of this coming. So if it's getting confusing, we're nearly at lunch. But what we have to do is think about what's fallen out of the time box. So one of the things we'll have developed also in foundations is our high level delivery plan. Okay, so this is established again in foundation. So maybe you're starting to see our important foundation. Now the delivery plan is very much high level. It basically covers the, uh, the whole timeline of the project. 
but there's no detail to our song. But what it does do, so it goes from start to finish, is break the project down into what we call increments. Now, there's no rules about what constitutes an increment, but as far as we're concerned, an increment is a potentially deployable solution. Something which we could go live. And all the manual says, quite simply, is that we should allocate time boxes to at least the first increment. Now, personally, I find it useful to allocate them arbitrarily across the whole project, but you don't have to do that. Okay. And the idea here is if this is time box, time box, time box, time box, any one time box won't have all musts in it. So the idea here is if we keep the time boxes on track, then we can guarantee that release date, guarantee that release date and so on. But it only works if you if you respect time boxes. Yeah. So at the end of an increment, we will have another, we'll have this retrospective, an increment retrospective. And what we might think at this point is that time box didn't deliver those coulds, that time box didn't deliver those musts. That time box didn't deliver those shoots. So now priorities can change. We might say, well, that was a could in that time box, but it now becomes a must in this time box. That should is still a should, and we've got some more coulds. That should is now a must, and so on. So you can have changing requirements. In other words, as the project develops, you might decide that you want to reprioritize as we go. So, yeah, it would have been nice, for example, if we could have put the renewal function in there, but we didn't. So now it becomes a must later on. And this is called incremental delivery. Delivering early value. Now, again, in answer to some of the questions there, typically an increment is a number of time boxes bundled into a release, typically. So think of this as a release, if you like. And the time boxes get assembled into a release. But there is no reason why, and I think this might be your question, Oliver, is really, why we can't deploy at the end of a time box. So a release could be just the work for one time box. So if you have an immediate problem or immediate thing you want to put out there, you can deploy at the end of a time box. You don't actually have to deploy at the end of a time box as well. Um, I don't think we, we don't particularly appreciate this, but one UK department holds their releases up into quarterly releases because they find that easier to deploy. But the idea is we should deploy, 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 and it only works if you keep respect the time boxes. Olive, did you have your hand up? Yes, I do. I uh, want to ask you, when we promote an, to another increment, uh, we can uh, lower down prioritization. For example, what was must in increment one couldn't be uh, the should or could in increment two. No, but it could yeah. be the other way around. We must we must deliver the must. That's the idea. So a should could be a should or a could be could now become must, or it could well be we don't need it anymore. You know, if you're building a uh, um, some marketing material for a sports event, event or a conference, if you don't get it delivered in the time box, you know, if you don't get it delivered in the time box, let's go back here, we say, well, there's no point thinking about that. Now we've missed the target date, we'll go live, you know, that's just, that now is a won't. That can happen as well. So priorities can change. 
at a project level, at a project level. Yeah. So what was a must, what was a should could become a must. What was a could could become a won't. What was a could could become a must. But once we've defined our must, at some point they will stay as must. And the last thing, and I know we've overrun a little bit here. Um, people don't always see this, but if we can deploy incrementally, what happens is we deploy at the end of an increment, then we go back onto the next increment. We could deploy something which we could improve. So we can go into here and we might through this work have identified new requirements which need to go back considered at a project level. So the, the big difference between, another big difference between an agile life cycle and a traditional life cycle, if you ask the project manager in an agile life cycle, in a traditional project life cycle, what phase are you in? What phase are you in? Then they will either say, well, it's design, build, test, or whatever. But that's not true in an agile project. In an agile project, it's much more, uh, shall we say, dynamic than that. We've implemented that, we're improving that, we're thinking of that, we're going on to that. So you do get immediate return on investment through incremental delivery while you're developing the rest. And that's a very quick overview of the life cycle. And when do we finish our project after the final deployment? Because this is now business as usual. And the difference between our agile life cycle <laughs> and a, uh, a product development, product development starts here. So this is, uh, this is product development. What Agile PM gives you is a full life cycle. And if some of you have come from a Scrum environment, there's no reason why you couldn't dump Scrum into here. It just works. But what Agile PM gives you the full life cycle because you've got governance in here and you've got a high level scoping, none of which is in product development. Ooh. So some food for thought there and quite a lot. Now we're going to build on that. All I've tried to do is to get the basic idea of overlap of the idea that we have an agreed scope and setup, but the, the detail emerges through evolutionary development. This is where we model, we prototype, we have discussions, we work things out, and the, the solution emerges through iterative development. So iterative development is what team does to build the solution. Incremental delivery says, let's try and get some early value. In. And the way you get early value in is delivering incrementally. But if you're amenable to that, you'll have early return on investment. At the end of an increment, we have a retrospective and we can readjust our priorities. So that's a big session. We're going to build on all of this. So if it's confused you, I shouldn't worry too much. We will take you forward. But I think we should stop for lunch now. Um, how about if we meet at 1.30? Does that feel okay for everybody, 40 minutes? And we'll take this into a little more detail and we start using some of the slides as well. So please keep asking questions. It's not easy. There's some more questions you can ask, the better. And I'll see you at 1.30. We will beat you into submission already. Okay, bye. Bye. Uh, no, that's okay. I can ask you later. <laughs> I was just wondering if I could make a question, keep thinking while I lunch. It's about the, when you just decide your shoulds and coulds, you already include everything in the time box or no? You take a subset of the of the requirements. It, it's part of them. It's okay. An agreed, it's an agreed subset. We don't take the whole set in. Okay, that's all right. Thank you. See you Enjoy later. Enough. Enjoy your lunch. Uh, all back in the room. Hello, hello. Hello. So, yes. Someone asked me a question. Um, just to say, um, is she here? Yes, she is. Jana and uh, um, Raphael, I, I, the, the exam board have um, given you the extra time. I've got that sorted this morning for you. So you get 25% dispensation. 
on uh, both exams, Jana, Raphael, you'll get 25% on the foundation exam. Just gives you a little bit of breathing space. Um, anyway, I don't think anyone else needs second language um, dispensation. I don't know about you, Lee, a bit Westy, and you, I mean, who knows? <laughs> so, oh, I did a Merthyr boy originally, so no. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's another language on its own. Hi. <laughs> Uh, right, so we I should have special dispensation for coming from there. <laughs> uh, so a lot of ideas in there. <clears throat> First thing I think is important is we should challenge the use of Agile at several points. We'll come on to how we do that tomorrow. Second thing I think is really important, we take the pressure off the customer. They no longer have to define exactly what they want. But what they do have to do is to set some high level requirements and we'll discuss what they look like tomorrow that we can then take forward and evolve a solution from. So there is a scope, which is slightly different from Scrum. Um, um, but they no longer have to define it in detail. <clears throat> we also have a plan, but the plan is very high level. There's no tasks on the overall delivery plan. It's what the project manager is watching out for. And all we do is allocate time boxes to at least the first increment. And an increment is a potentially deployable solution, let's say a release. And it's generally a number of time boxes grouped together to give us some early return on investment. It could be just one time box. And the idea is to keep the time boxes to time and then have a, have a reprioritization exercise at the end of the increment. We take a subset of the PRL, this is what I was saying to Raphael and some of you may have left, into each time box. Yeah. So we've got an agreed set of requirements which go into each frame box. Lee, you might think of that being a sprint backlog. Yeah, And they then, having accepted as realistic, work on it. The, the detail evolves, emerges through modeling, prototyping, further discussion, workshops, and all the rest of it. Um, they run daily stand-ups. Um, if we start to hit a snag and they, the team believes it won't deliver everything, then they, they do have the authority, it's called empowerment, to discard coulds and worst case deliver shoulds. Yeah, that's okay. They don't have to ask permission to do this, but they cannot, they can't, <clears throat> sorry, they can't not deliver musts and they can't just decide that a must is a should. You know, those parameters are set for the time box. End of the time box, review and retrospective. The retrospective is looking at behaviors. Did we have the right team here? Did we run in a reasonable way? And the review says what's fallen out and what's fallen out gets reprioritized. The other thing to note, I guess, is that at any one point, the solution could be in different states, partly deployed, partly being explored, partly being improved, partly being thought about. It's like spinning plates. We finished the project after the last deployment. So quite a lot of ideas in there, I know. Um, the one thing which blows people's minds quite often is that you may well introduce a could or a should before a must, because we're very much driven by value. And so something can be a must in the overall project, and I mentioned the renewal function, but not a must in the immediate increment or release. You've got to think about it fairly carefully. So, <clears throat> Having set all that in place, we're going to develop this quite a lot more. I was just introducing the basic ideas. Any questions I can um, answer there by that, at that point? No. Quite a different way of thinking is delivering by value. So the traditional approach, you know, phase one is usually delivering everything you need and add on bells and whistles later. We move away from that. Um, evolutionary development, generally we love, we have lots of workshop discussions, models, prototypes, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so what I want to do now, bring a bit of theory out, so I'm going to share my screen. If you've got your manual to hand, that will be um, a useful thing, because we're going to drive it through the manual. Just get you thinking a bit about what the uh, basics are, um, and then I'm going to get you doing something again fairly shortly. Oh, good, they say. We want to do things. Keep asking questions. That's fine. <clears throat> More questions, the better. If I can't handle them at this point, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll remember to bring them out later on in the event. So um, 
this is the presentation file, which is all drawn from the manual really as well. So uh, let's get thinking about that. So um, we talked about what we're gonna do. We've talked about the exams, but more coming. Um, I will send you the link to the, uh, <clears throat> where you can try the, uh, the practice paper online if you want. So, um, but they're down for maintenance on Monday night. So tonight's not a good night to send it, but I'll send you an email later on about where you can practice clicking if you want to, but I'm also gonna send you a, uh, uh, a sample paper to work on as well. So everything is based on what we call the Agile PM version two handbook, but it's easier to call it the manual to be honest. Um, and you can use this in the practitioner exam only, not in the foundation exam, but you're allowed to use it in the practitioner exam. And, you know, it's there as a backstop, really, rather than as a constant reference. Splits into two uh, sections. Section one is the foundations and all these foundation paper uh, questions are based on section one. And they're all pure fact. There's no interpretation in the foundation exam. The practitioner exam is based on the whole manuals, um, but of course you've got the manual for that. And we will be working through the whole manual in our sessions that we go through. There are a couple of useful um, appendices. One which I think I always draw to people's attention is Appendix A, which is a glossary of terms, page 197. So if when you're refreshing or reviewing or in the exam, you come across a piece of terminology and you're not sure what it means, it should be in the glossary. And that's also quite a useful way of reviewing the content of the book. And there's also a useful index on page 213, um, which uh, tell, takes you to shows you where to find things. But I'm going to try and show you that as we go through. Uh, so a bit of IPR for you to start off with. Um, <clears throat> this can be a bit confusing, but don't worry about it. Don't let it be confusing. The, ad, the, the consortium changed its name about two years ago. Um, they've been going since 1995, and they were originally called the Dynamic Systems Development Consortium. So you'll see the use DSDM quite a lot, Dynamic Systems Development uh, Method Consortium. And a couple of years ago, they changed their name to, re to really to ditch the word systems, because systems implies IT, and the low agile PM is often used in a software environment to develop software. It's not an IT method. A lot of my work I do is non-IT. So they changed their name to be the Agile Business Consortium. <clears throat> but what they didn't do, because it was copyrighted, was change the name of the process, which is at the heart of Agile PM. So quite often in the exams and in the slides and in the manual, you'll see reference to DSDM. Uh, don't let it spook you. As far as you're concerned, DSDM and Agile PM are synonymous. So as far as you're concerned, they're the same thing. They just haven't changed the name. So um, there are um, there there's a program management approach. There's an overall framework. Um, but Agile PM is the one that we're working on this week. But as I say, as far as you're concerned, DSDM, Agile PM are synonymous. There's very little difference between them. Um, here's the full list of topics that we're going to discuss. If I'd put that up this morning, it would have spooked you a bit, so I didn't. Um, and we're going to start off this, this afternoon by talking about some of the basic ideas and basically revamping what I've already talked about. And then once we get through here, I'm going to ask you to look at our case studies. So There's not going to be too much theory before we get you doing something. So um, what is Agile? Well, you know, it's a... It's a it's a, it's a very broad church, Agile. People um, see it in different ways. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it goes from hot desking, uh, working at home, flexible working hours, modeling, prototyping, and all the rest of it. And, and it's worth bearing in mind that we're talking about Agile in a project environment. You know, that's what we're talking about here. It's a combination of Agile and uh, and and. and uh, uh, and project work together. So there is a boundary around what we're doing and there is governance. Um, and you have to think about firstly, whether you whether you want the, the work to be treated as a project or not. But it is interesting how many people think they understand Agile and they don't. Um, <clears throat> for my sins a few years ago, I, I did some work with an organization called Civil Service Learning, 
which was um, part of our remit was to promote agile working within government. And as part of that contract, we used to run uh, what we call breakfast briefings. They were one hour. And we used to run them between eight and nine o'clock uh, in government departments across the country for senior leaders, just to give them a flavor of what Agile was about and just get them thinking along the lines that we did this morning. And they were only an hour. But, um, you know, uh, I was in, uh, I've been on television department, I was in a government department in England. And one senior leader who was due to attend came rushing into me and said, I can't come to the briefing. We've got operational um problems and I, I really can't I really haven't got the time and I said well you know we that's that's up to you really whether you come or not you know it's uh, the, the the sessions on and there'll be more sessions and so on. he said well <clears throat> it's okay he said because I know what I tell him well oh, okay well there we are good for you uh, and he said yeah a lot of post-it notes isn't it post-it notes on whiteboards I said man you you know it all that's all I was going to say and he said great I knew it was and off he went, very happy. Um, so although, although we do use post-it notes quite a lot, and I don't know if anyone's come across a tool called Trello, which is basically, uh, yeah, basically electronic post-it notes, isn't it? Um, that, that's not what it's around. You know, there are various definitions of Agile. And um, I guess, you know, from the outset, it, it, it's, a, it's a generic description of lots of different ways of working. For example, it gives us a lot of flexibility. We should be able to adjust our process to cater for, for change uh, as much as we can. You know, we should be able, if we need to, <clears throat> to deploy, if you like, to go live with one time box at a time if we wish to. So there's lots of different things that, that, that give us flexibility to, to adjust to business needs. It's a very different way of working with the customer. If you think about the traditional thing, you know, we have a lot of customer involvement at the beginning, and then it, it, we, hand, we basically hand over control to the technical people till the end. And therefore, the, the customer is sort of, you know, his role is one of signing things off and so on, whereas we don't see it that way. <clears throat> you know, the way, you know, we have the customer involved all the way through. In fact, you will see there's a role called the business ambassador, which drives out the detail and makes most of the business decisions. Just as I tried to describe with the kitchen, why would you hand over control to the technical people? You wanna drive out the right solution for you. So the customer has to be involved all the way through. And of course, <clears throat> that means the customer has to want to play. And again, quite often I get uh, business representatives saying, well, we usually hand this over to IT. Well, why would you do that? You know, it's your solution. You're going to be asked to use it at the end. You're going to be asked to, to maximize the value from it. So why, why don't you get involved all the way through? And I think we know if we ever have anyone working in our house, you don't just let them get on with it. You keep an eye. Through this, we reckon that the final solution should meet the real business need and not something which was specified 12 months ago. Yeah, and that's quite an important idea. Um, also, this idea of not forcing the customer to have all the detail up front. Um, we defer detail, decisions about detail until the last responsible moment. This comes up as a foundation question. They, they often leave these last three words out and ask you to fill in the missing words. And the answers are until the last responsible moment. And I guess it goes back to what I was saying about going for a meal. Why would you pick your dessert until you've had your main course? You don't need to. We can come to that detail later, which means that um, you have to be prepared to live with a bit of uncertainty. And that, again, is a problem for people who are more used to traditional ways of thinking. What is my new, what is my new solution going to look like? I don't know, but it will meet your requirements. Um, there are a whole number of um, <clears throat> agile approaches which live under the sort of agile umbrella. The ones on these side are fairly well known, I guess the first three particularly, um, but they're really product development. There's no element of project. If you're a Scrum person, there's no mention of the word project in the Scrum guide. You know, Kanban is really about workflows and controlling work in progress. There's no real mention of a project. So they're, they're more focused on product delivery. Whereas at a project level, well, what have we really got? We've got DSDM stroke, same thing, Agile PM. There's an IT version uh, approach called the Scaled Agile Framework. 
But, you know, the Agile PM in particular gives you the full life cycle, gives you the full life cycle, including governance. And so you have to decide if it's a project, you need the fuller life cycle. If you're just developing product after product, then you may not need the feel the benefit of Agile PM. I think that the, probably the most um, <clears throat> well-known definition of what is Agile is on page 13 of the manual. And it's called the Agile Manifesto. And this was put together in America in 2001 by a number of software houses. And it, it's really a set of values. And, and all it's saying is we value individuals and the way they interact over process and tools, you know, which isn't to say we don't need processes. And it isn't to say the tools aren't useful because they are. There are a number of very good agile tools, Jira, Trello, quite a few areas there. Um, but we don't let them drive out the solution. We're not going to be slaves to process. We're going to use process flexibly. We're going to, we're going to use tools where, where, where it makes sense. So a good example of that would be looking at our um, the plot delivery plan. Now, I've illustrated here with post-it notes on a flip chart. That could be a perfectly acceptable delivery plan. Yeah. Just post-it notes stuck on a flip chart. That's all it needs to be or a whiteboard. Um, however, if your corporate culture is we use MS Project here, everything has to be a Gantt chart, you could easily turn that into a Gantt chart. But we don't demand it. So, you know, we, 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 we don't let the tool slow us down. But if we have to do that, then we will. Um, we, we'd rather play around with things, try things out, rather than have what we call comprehensive documentation. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't mean no documentation. We provide enough documentation to support what we're doing, to support audit trails if we need to, but we don't produce the spec. As I said this morning, if you, if, if you see draw, write a specification as the answer, it's not going to be the correct answer. Yeah. And I think that, it, I think that uh, again, represents the spirit of the age. I know, Jake, I'm guessing you've got a, a Garmin or a, something along those lines to, for your running. You know, if I, I bought a new Garmin a year ago. If I bought it 10 years ago, it'd have a manual, the, manual, manual this thick with all the menu options in there. Now it just basically tells you the on and off buttons and all the advices on YouTube. You know, if you buy a tablet you know, or, or an iPhone or whatever, you know, you don't have pages and pages of documentation with it now. You try it out, you play around with it. And that's the idea. You know, I bought a, a new car, a new to me car. It's not a new car, but it was new to me a little while ago. And I was quite amused that the manual was about 400 pages. Why would I read the manual? A, I'm a bloke, so I don't need to. But B, you know, I know the round thing. I know how to turn the round thing to make it go left to right. I know how the pedals work on the floor. I can see how the lights work. They're automatic anyway. Crucially, I can work the stereo um, and the aircon. Uh, I don't know. Well, people say, well, what about the tire pressures inside the petrol flap? Yeah, they're written down there. So why would I read the manual? Only one reason ever. If a random light comes on the dashboard and I think, oh, I wonder what that is. Do I need to worry about it? Then I'll read the manual, page 384 or whatever, you know? So it's that kind of idea, really. And um, again, if you think about it, we do this in life, don't we? You know, change the word software to solution. You know, you, you if you're going to go and buy something, you know, you, you go to the Apple store, you try things out, you test drive dark cars, uh, you try on clothes. It's exactly the same thing. Um, this can often be a sticking point. Fixed price, fixed delivery. You can do it, but we'd much rather have collaborative approaches. And if you join the consortium, um, after the exam, there is a there is a contract template on there. Well, the reason we don't particularly like fixed price, fixed delivery is we haven't got the spec. And what we find it be is it becomes quite adversarial with you know customer and supplier not really trusting each other, not really working together. So we'd rather have the sort of collaboration approaches. And you'll see all our practices, all our techniques are about collaboration. And we still need a plan. But we don't produce the all singing, all dancing, overly detailed master plan up front because it's going to change. You know, I tried again to illustrate that very quickly. We'll come back to it here. You know, that might need to go into that. We might bring things forward. 
you know, things change. So we should be able to respond to change. And now at this point, people often say, well, hang on, you said that Agile PM isn't necessarily about software. This is all about software. Well, the answer is not really. If you change the word software to solution, it still works. It still works. Um, you know, it's just that that was the original manifesto. And the consortium have brought out their own version now, which talks about solutions rather than software. Um, so first thing I think you need to discover, decide if you're bringing about change is, is it a simple product development or is it a project or part of a program? If it's a product development, you don't need the early governance parts, so you can start here. But if it's a project, what well, Agile PM gives you the full project lifecycle. And so that's, that's a decision to be made right at the outset. Do we want to run this as a project or not? And there's some reasonable arguments to be had for running things as projects or not as projects, which is outside what we're doing this week. And what Agile PM gives you is, uh, uh, is, is, is a full life cycle. Um, you'll find these benefits written down on page 14. Might be want to take a note of them. They often ask, give, give you a foundation question, which says, which of the following is a benefit of using Agile PM stroke DSDM? And they're, they're listed for you. Okay, so move, moving on a bit. Now we're going to look at chapter three, which is the philosophy, and move into the principles. Okay. I live in a world where there's too much jargon and too much BS. Um, this diagram on top right here, which is on page 16, is known, I promise you, as the Agile Temple. Just makes you want to poop, really. But it looks like the Parthenon in, a in Athens. And basically, the roof is a philosophy. Here's a philosophy. It's supported by eight principles. And the principles are get themselves supported by processes, people, products, and practices. So they've gone over leaf on the left, letter P as well, haven't they, really? And it all should be underpinned by common sense and pragmatism. So it's not rules. It's guidance to work within. And most projects are a blend. And if you look at the bottom left-hand corner of page 16, it even defines common sense for you. It, um, it, says, it says common sense doesn't include specialist knowledge. And very, very sadly, that's a foundation question. What is not part of common sense? Specialized knowledge. And the idea is, you know, you, you don't need to have specialized knowledge to have common sense. You know, you can, uh, I'm sure we all know people who've got brains the size of the planet, but they've got very much lacking in common sense. And so uh, everything we're talking about has to be applied with common sense. It's, it, it's, it's not a set of rules. I'll give you a good example. This morning I talked about stand-ups. This is our daily team meeting, which allows the team to reorganize and replan. And we call them stand up to keep them short and sweet, to save people sitting down and talking about the cup final and what's happening in Game of Thrones and all that kind of stuff. That's all. And um, you'd also don't even need to book a meeting room. You can meet in the canteen or somewhere. And I promise you that literally someone phoned me up, a project manager, and said, uh, it was a little while ago, now I have to admit, and said, um, we can't use our job PM. I said, well, right, what, well, what's the problem? Senior leaders not on side, you know, problems with collaborating. Those usually are the things. He said, no, nothing to do with that. He said, I said, what's the problem? He said, one of our people has got, one of our team has got mobility issues. I said, right, okay. He said, so I couldn't possibly ask her to stand up for a meeting. I said, mate, well, it's guidance, you know, you haven't got to drag people out of a chair or anything like that, for good sake, you know. <laughs> it's guidance. He went, oh, well, it does say stand up. I mean, no, mate, it's, but, you know, that's just a device. It's not meant to be rules. You know? Oh, right. I didn't see that. And then you do get people who see things very literally, which is not what we want. Um, here's a philosophy, which is in, uh, in, in bold italics here. Best value emerges, and we want value to emerge from our projects, aligned to clear business goals. Well, people say, yeah, we always have to have a goal or a vision, don't you, for a project? Yeah, but if, you're, if your projects last in 15, 18 months, are you, are you sure the vision is clear to everybody? Is it communicated? Are we working towards it? We should deliver frequently. I mean, you don't have to, um, 
uh, de deliver and deploy on an incremental basis, but it's a good thing to do. Agile projects never go quiet. You get usable solutions being pr produced uh, frequently. And here's the kicker down the bottom, collaboration of motivated and empowered people. Okay, well, collaboration is a big deal to us. We'll talk about the makeup of the solution development team um, this afternoon. Um, and you're gonna be asked to put a team together overnight. Um, we, we forget grades, we forget ranks, we forget egos. We're all, the team is a team. It's a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. And, you know, we cut down departmental barriers. So, you know, it will have a mixture, for example, of IT and business people. It will have a mixture of different construction people. You know, it's a, it's a team. It's like the way Nissan build cars in, in, in Sunderland. The team builds a Lexus. They're not always all there at the same time, but the team takes ownership of the solution. We want motivated now, empowered people, empowered people. Well, <clears throat> I was talking with them. Um, I don't know if you work with them at all, Lee, the, sh the shared services people in Cardiff I was working with last week, NHS shared services. Um, I don't know if Jake comes across them as well, but, uh, um, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty switched. I thought they were pretty switched on guys, really. They're good. But I, I have done some work with some NHS trusts, and this was pre-COVID, where motivation was pretty low. You know, I think the NHS has had a, had a, t had a tough time, hasn't it, really, to be honest? They've been bashed about and cut back and all the rest of it. And uh, one NHS trust up in Cumbria uh, was struggling. Uh, staff weren't happy, weren't leaving, weren't performing well. So they introduced agile ways of working in, in the hope it would motivate staff. And what they found out through looking through surveys and so on, that actually as acting as a motivating factor, people like working in this way. You know, and it actually they felt part, they felt valued, they felt part of the solution rather than having solutions imposed upon them. And, you know, it did help with that thing. The other thing is empowerment. You know, empowerment's an important idea. And um, some senior leaders have said to me, you're, you're asking me to trust my team. Well, that's a terrible thing, isn't it, really? What about that? But uh, yeah, the answer is yes, but it's a controlled trust. The team, the solution development team, can't do what it likes. So they will discuss the requirements they're going to work on with the project manager. What they can't do is reprioritize must down to shoulds or coulds. Yeah, they have to work within the, pri the, the priorities, as I was saying to you, Raphael, before lunch, that have been set at a project level. Um, they can't, they can't have scope creep. They can't widen out the time box. They can't add in new things. They can't deliver something different from what was agreed. But what they can do is explore depth and detail through iteration. And what they're also able to do is to dispense with coulds and maybe shoulds. So it's kind of a controlled empowerment. So, you know, we're not gonna let them do what they want because that would be anarchy. The other thing is not everyone wants to be empowered. Well, people, excuse me, often have their own reasons for coming to work. Some people just want to come to work and do a nine to five. And that's fine. That's fine. You know, um, so, you know, we and often that we find that's because they've been criticized in the past. They've made decisions and in the past, which have been mistakes. We don't mind people make mistakes, provided they learn from experience. That's fine. So, you know, we want to control the empowerment. Empowerment is just delegated authority. And we believe the philosophy, which is in bold here, is achieved when everyone understands our, our goals, if you like, our vision and objectives. I'm going to get you thinking about that shortly. They're empowered to make decisions within their knowledge base, collaborate, work together to deliver solutions to agreed timescales in accordance with priority. And recognize that, you know, things will change. And I mentioned that this morning about my wife buying that top. She never wore, by the way. That's a nuisance, really. Um, the diagram on uh, figure 3B uh, on page 17 is, is quite useful. Raphael pointed this one out before lunch, I think, which is moving away from the traditional approach. If you think of the traditional approach, we have a fixed number of requirements or features. Call them what you will. You know, the spec. And because we have to deliver everything, time and cost, look at the colouring, tends to extend 
so that we deliver everything. And I guess we all know about projects which slip a week every week, you know, it happens all the time. And I think it is true, if you look at the colouring on quality, you know, quality tends to be diluted. We do tend to skimp on testing, handover, uh, implementation, preparation, and so on. Yeah. And that means that it's very difficult to plan around something where, 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 where the date is changing all the time. You know, it doesn't work like that, you know. So DS3M stroke Agile PM, same thing, turns it upside down. It says, look, once we enter into a time box, we will fix the time and we will fix the, the, the budget for that time box. When we're thinking about what we can achieve, each feature will have quality criteria associated with it. So the Zoom, for example, is going to be three times digital. But as we move through, we do accept that we may not be able to deliver everything. So it's turning it upside down. But it doesn't mean the things we discard um, will, will be forgotten forever, because at the end of the time box, we have a review and a retrospective where we decide what's going to happen to the things that fell out of the time box. And I think it's like, imagine if you will, see me, we, we're used to driving by time, aren't we, really? Imagine if you will, you know, you're the, you're the editor of a, one of our wonderful newspapers, and, and you've got your front page lined up, um, at the moment, some some trivia about a TV pronounced announcer, I expect. Um, and you've got a hundred pages that you've got to fill going down to the sports results. Will Man City do the travel? Uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you've you've got these hundred pages to fill. You've got it lined up nicely, and you've got to get you've got to press the button on print at eight o'clock tonight. What if what if what if old Charlie Boy? What if the King says, "I've had enough of this. I don't fancy it anymore. I think I'll pack this in." I think, you know, Buck, Buckingham Palace puts a notice out which says um, Charles has packed it in. He's going to hand over to William. You know what you can do? <laughs> what are you going to do? Because you can't ignore that new requirement because all your competitors will be doing it. So what are you going to do? You're going to put that on the new front page and things are going to drop out at the back end because you've still only got 100 pages to fill and you've still got to make it by eight o'clock tonight. So it's shifting sands. You, you see it all the time. You know, and if you haven't got time to deal with it properly, you know, because maybe you're only an hour before print, you know, you, you, you'll just do breaking news. King's packed in, more information coming. And you see this all the time, don't you? If you look at Sky News, uh, your Sky News app or your BBC News app, how often does it come up? Breaking news, more information coming because we, we're, we're trying to keep it, keep it up to date. It's that kind of thinking that we bring in. And that brings me on to look at the principles. Now, this is chapter four of the manual. And the, these underpin everything that we do. People often call them the mindset. If, if you see a question in the exam about what is known as the mindset, the mindset which underpins Agile PM, it's the eight principles. The eight principles. And these are kind of, you know, guiding obligations. These these. You know, we would say that if you if you if you're not applying the the principles, you are risking the successful use of Agile PM in your project. Yeah. So what I want to just walk you through these, you'll see these avatars appearing quite a lot throughout the course, and then I'm going to get you doing something based on this. Uh, is everyone okay for about another ten minutes or so? Anyone need a break? Can I just check? I realise it's that lovely afternoon session. You know, that nice for well, let's fall asleep at two o'clock. Anyone need a short one? Or are we okay? Are we okay? I think Ollis is looking very smart there. I know that's not him really. He's uh, got more hair then, Ollis. He's not talking to me. Oh, here he comes. Hi, oh, he's, still, he's still got quite a bit. Can you repeat? Yeah, we can hear you. Go on. And we were looking at, we were admiring your photograph on your other screen. Your haircut. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, let me just take you through the principles. We, you will find that we've discovered, we've covered quite a lot of these already. And then I'm going to ask you to look at our case study for a while. So the first one, notice the avatar is a target. You know, if you're the project manager and everything is aimed here at the project manager, you need to make sure the solution development team focus on the business need. Yeah. So we'll talk about the makeup of the team after in the next session when we finish this. 
but they need to understand the business priority. So as part of the kickoff, they need to be clear on what the musts are, what the shoulds are, what the coulds are, and maybe what won't be in this time box. Yeah. Through this, we should be able to establish a valid business justification for what we're doing. And here's the thing to watch out for from the exam perspective. We guarantee the musts, and there is a name for the must, which is called the minimum usable subset. Other people may have come across MVP, minimum, minimum viable product. Anyone come across that? We don't use that phrase in this one, just to let you know. Uh, minimum usable subset. They quite often will ask you what, what that means. Minimum usable subset with the must. So yeah, we guarantee the must, but you know, shoulds are called shoulds for a reason. You know, although a pic camera only needs to take pictures, we, you really want it to store pictures, have a battery, have a zoom, have a flash. So, you know, you, you want to be thinking a bit more ahead of the must. And it's quite important that, um, you know, we don't just focus on only the must, if I'm honest. Um, we will deliver on time. People will never believe you. Because let's be honest, projects are, uh, have a reputation, do they not? for delivering late over budget project uh, solutions. But we will deliver on time. When you, when you say that, people say, yeah, well, you, you'll chuck money at it. Will you? No, no, we'll stick, once we've agreed a budget, we'll stick to that as well. Yeah. Okay, so you, you'll, you'll, you won't do testing properly, will you? Yeah, we'll do testing properly. Okay, so what's gonna give? Well, what's gonna give is you may not have everything at this point, but you will have something of value at the end of a time box. So, you know, we guarantee to deliver workable solutions to time and budget, but you have to accept it may not be everything at that point, but we can pick up the other things later. And I, I promise you, but once you start um, delivering on time, confidence in the project grows. People start to say, well, that's pretty good. Didn't get everything, but we have got useful things on time and on budget. And, um, you know, we've probably got 80% of what we want on time on budget. And, and the view is that, you know, it's better to have 80% of what you want on time and on budget uh, in place rather than waiting forever for, for something which you don't know whether, when it's going to come. And, and also, if you're going to plan, you know, people often forget that the project is only part of the wider change initiative. You know, if you're, for example, my, um, the company I mentioned this morning, the, uh, uh, the financial services company, they were very much driven by marketing people. I don't think anyone here is a marketing person, but my view of marketing people is they're very optimistic uh, about what can be achieved because they're marketing people. Um, and the marketing people, you know, in, in that instance, had placed advertisements in the press for, let's say, I can't remember exactly, but let's say eight weeks in advance, saying we are now switched to an online environment. You can buy motor insurance from us at www.whatever.com. They also um, developed what they thought were vaguely amusing uh, TV adverts saying, come to www.com, whatever, you know, that's where you should be looking for. Yeah. So it's no point the IT guys being late, is it? They have to be on time, you know, otherwise it underpins the whole basis of the project, you know? So it's like, you know, so, you know, we got to start delivering on time. They may not have been everything, but they delivered usable solutions on time. You know, it's like if you're organizing a, a sporting event or a conference and you're producing marketing materials, you know, if you deliver them a week late, it's a waste of time, isn't it? Und undermines the whole project rationale. You got to run. If you remember those of us in South Wales, may remember a few years ago when NATO came uh, to visit South Wales, when Obama was president, you, you couldn't move in South Wales without being behind a fence. The security was so tight and all the hotels were full from from, from Chapstow to Swansea, as I recall. You know, but the fencing was important for security reasons. You know, there's no point the, the guy installing the fences, phoning up the USA embassy and saying, can you tell Mr. Mr. Obama, we're gonna be a bit late on the fencing. Uh, can he come back a month later? We'll have it done by then. No, you gotta do it, haven't you? You know, so we gotta drive on time. Otherwise, what's the point? And it does work, but it only works if you respect time boxes. Collaboration. Oh, there's so many HR issues which are not in the manual. So many HR issues which are un, which are kind of in, implied but not stated in the manual. You know this idea that we don't pass things on. 
you know, that the team builds a solution. So, you know, the business involvement particularly is important. You can't just pass it on to the techies. As you know, I was talking about the kitchen this morning, you know, you, you, you're going to have to use this kitchen. You need to be there driving out the detailed solutions. Do you want the fridge there? Do you want uh, green doors or whatever? You know, so we want, we want a collaborative team. And ideally, it would be a small team. I'll talk about that. Ideally, in the same space. But quite often nowadays, we have to work with remote teams, uh, using Zoom, using Teams, using WebEx, sometimes in different time zones. You know, um, but the, 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 the difference, I think, is the business representative's involvement is now proactive. You're not just there to sign things off and to check things off, you know. Um, everyone needs to have clear empowerment levels um, and, and, and we need to work as a team and, and, and you, you've got to ignore grades and ranks. Uh, this is really difficult. I mean, I, in military environments, I've done more work, if I'm honest, with the Navy than I have with the other services. But it's very different, difficult when you know the lieutenant commander is correct and is being overridden by the commander because he's got more bars on his shoulder than the other one, you know. And it's very different, difficult when we have big discussions and everyone goes off to different messes for lunch. It's, it makes life easy, different. And not only in a military environment, you know, if we work with a military environment, what we try to do is to uh, say, leave your rank at the door so nobody wears a uniform, you know, we'll all resort to woolly pullies or whatever, you know. Uh, but you see it in the, um, in the private sector as well. Um, I did some work with a bank a few years ago, and I think I can tell you it's a two, in, the, in the teeth of the banking crisis of 2008-2009, and um, that they realised that they were a very fragmented organisation. It was Lloyds Banking Group. And what they wanted to do is to encourage their various divisions to feel that they were part of one group, Lloyds Banking Group. And at the time, they had Halifax, Bank of Scotland, Lloyds, and Scottish Widows. And they all had very strong individual identities. And to the extent that the people who work for Scottish Widows would simply not answer the phone, Scottish Widows Lloyds Banking Group, because they didn't want to be associated with Lloyds Banking Group at the time. So they put a team together to try to promote one way of working. And the team had representatives from all four divisions. They've actually sold off to Scottish Widows now. And the team occasionally met in London, sometimes in Edinburgh, sometimes in Halifax, to move around the group. And it, it caused lots of problems, because we, and I was only on the periphery of it, really, giving some advice. I wasn't part of the team. But, you know, they know the team would rock up in Edinburgh, and some would say, hey, there's a new Italian restaurant opened. Should we go down there for a meal tonight? You know, good, you think, team bonding. And then somebody would look up the menu and go, blimey, you know, that's a that's an expensive restaurant. And one guy would say, yeah, so, well, so what? So, well, I'm... I'm only on 20 quid a night, you know, I can't spend that. And so, you know, it's not, not in the manual, but as a, as a project manager, you can't do much about it, except be aware of it. And um, I've seen things like this. Where are you staying this week? Ibis. Oh, you're in the Ibis, yeah. You, Scotsman. What, the five-star hotel on Waverley Bridge? Yeah. With the sauna, with the swimming pool, with the gym, with the room service. Yeah. How come? Well, terms and conditions. It just causes friction. You know, it's very difficult. So you try and get the team work. And, and also, um, we're going to have a workshop. We're going to have a discussion Friday afternoon. Oh, I can't come Friday afternoon. Oh, well, you'll leave you. No, I'm, I've got to get to the airport. You've got to get to the airport. Yeah, I'm flying back to London. You fly back to London? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how come I've got to catch the train, which takes like six hours? <laughs> well, I don't know. That's your terms and conditions. You know, so, you know, being a, you, there's not much you can often do about it as a, as a project manager, but these things do get in the way and can cause friction. You do what you can to try and overcome them, to get people to, you know, work together as a team. So there's lots of HR stuff here. Um, never compromising quality. Okay, one of the things that you see in the uh, life, life cycle overall is there's no testing phase. Because we review, inspect, and test as we go. Now, we do define our test strategy here in foundation, sorry, here in development. We define the standards, including any external standards, GDPR, cybersecurity, where we're going to build the work to, and how we're going to test. And we review, inspect, and test in various ways as we're exploring the solution. So what we think is that errors will emerge earlier rather than later, which is what we're trying to do. Yeah. 
And so we have an ongoing testing. Yeah? Watch out for this, though, because we don't see reducing scope as being reducing quality. Quality is a measurable criteria. The zoom should be three times digital. If we don't put the zoom on, we don't see that as reducing quality. We see that as de-scoping. That comes up quite a lot in the practitioner test. Um, build incrementally from, from foundations. Okay, so all that means is the foundations element is important. Yeah, this is set up and scope really, but it's a high level scope. It's a high level scope. Let me put that on there. It's not so detailed that there's no option for, for innovation. You know, we talk about doing enough analysis and design upfront. Watch out for these initials, comes up in the exam, EDUF, enough design upfront. So if you don't have any kind of design thoughts ahead of your product delivery, that's no design upfront. If you overthought it, you have big design upfront. A good example of that is my friend that uh, builds B&Qs, my friend Simon. He, 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 there's no scope for being agile in his projects. There just isn't, because he has a specification for B&Q, which has been drawn together over the years, because all B&Qs are basically the same. It's like TGI Fridays, they're all the same. He gives a spec to Lang O'Rourke or Costain or whoever builders he's using nowadays, and says, right, build me one of those guys. You know, he doesn't want them coming back and saying, this orange color is a bit naff. Have you thought of pale blue? You know, should we move, just build the orange box? So there's very little approach, uh, opportunity to be innovative in his projects. Um, but, um, you know, if, you, if you're developing a new retail park, there's more opportunity. So it's a bit of a dark art here that foundation should be scoping enough so that we can take the thing forward without being overly fixed, that there's no scope to be innovative. And, and the other thing is, at the end of each increment, we have a retrospective. And as the name implies, res retrospective looks back at what we've done and how we've behaved and looks forward. And things which have fallen out get reprioritized. Yeah, so we do have change in priorities through retrospective. The other thing it gives us an opportunity to do, let's make sure we haven't lost this, is to revisit the business justification for the project, to make sure the project remains viable and desirable. So that's the idea of the incremental retrospective. Is it okay to go into the next increment? Iterative development. Well, this is really through the time box. Now, I tried to explain that in a non-IT way this morning by talking about my kitchen development. You know, we had a right, we had a high level view of what was wanted, just a list, worktops, cupboards, ovens, and then through iteration, we 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 drew up an initial diagram. We 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 reviewed it. We said let's make a few changes. We produced a model. We reviewed it and so on. So what happens is the detail emerges later through iterative development. The detail emerges later rather than sooner. That comes up as a foundation question. Detail emerges later rather than sooner. And the idea is we, you know, we're prepared to accept changes. Let's move the fridge. What happens if we move the draining board? And that's iterative development. And if we can, if we can align that with uh, modeling and prototyping, so much the better. Uh, the next one is we need to make sure we never go quiet. Um, agile, agile projects never go quiet. We communicate continuously and clearly, which is not the same as sending everybody a copy of your email. You know, we, we, we like to use what we call our practices or techniques. Discussions through workshops, producing models, time boxing with stand-ups. You know, very transparent ways of seeing where we are, where we're going, so that we can we can all see what's happening. Yeah, so that that's what we do. You know, we use prototypes, we use models, we have discussions, and so on. We we do produce documentation, but we only produce documentation if there's any value to it. We don't produce documentation for the sake of it. 
Now that means, of course, if we have external auditors, we have to keep information for audit trails and so on. We have to remember that when we walk away from the project, we've got to support it. So, you know, but we don't produce documentation for the sake of it. And we're always honest and transparent. And again, not everyone likes it. Not everyone likes it. You know, you do get people who say, well, I'll update you at the end of the week, you know, I haven't done so well today. Well, that's, where are you now then? And the idea of the, of the, of the burn down chart, work outstanding over time means we know precisely where we are and that gives us transparency and if we can if we haven't got transparency we can't be in control you know all agile teams you will see they all have whiteboards or team boards call them what you will so that we can see you know the time box plan <coughs> is invariably task lists scribbled on a whiteboard we monitor progress using things like burn down charts so it's it's apparent whether we're, whether we're on track or not. You know, sometimes you have to be more formal than others, but we should we should be having enough um, sort of uh, tracking and reporting so we're all in control of where we're going. And those are our eight principles. And you know, it's important from a project manager's perspective that we understand that everybody recognizes the principles are important. You know, if you're breaking any of the principles, then essentially you're um, you, you're uh, you're you're risking agile PM. And we want the team to all be part of the control function. You know, we need to make sure that we're on track here. Um, I don't agree with this. Consider organising a short workshop to agree how the principles are achieved. We should definitely do that. We should definitely run that. If I'm ever kicking off a project, one of the very first things I do. Is, is, is walk through those principles, perhaps in a little bit more detail, and say, okay, how are we gonna make, how are we gonna build collaboration here? How are we gonna communicate? How are we gonna prioritize? Yeah, what is our incremental structure gonna look like? Getting people thinking about it, yeah? And of course, the idea is, at the end of every increment, we should be looking at how well Agile PM is working. Do we have to shore it up? Do we have to do more work on getting people comfortable with it? Because, you know, we need to keep the behaviors uh, up and running. And those are our eight principles. And I want to see if I can get some multitasking done now. This might be tricky, but it's okay for women. Men can't multitask, so we're not really good at it. Really. So one of the things I sent you last week was the case study. Um, it's called the Miller's Marmalade. I don't know if you could dig that out. I don't know if you've got it printed or whatever, but I sent it to you last week. Um, you'll never look at a jar of marmalade in the same way again. Uh, it's actually nothing to do with marmalade. It's a business transformation project, as you'll see. But what I'm kind of hoping you'll do, we're going to work on it. So when I say multitasking, I want to give you a break now. And when we come back, I want you to have read, if you will, and be prepared to discuss um, the first two pages of the case study. So pages two and three, history and background through to work to be done. It's just two pages of A4. Just two pages of A4. So if we could um, perhaps meet at um, 20 to three, with you having read that and be prepared to ask me any questions you want on it. And we'll see where we take you forward. Is that okay? Everyone's got that to hand? So pages two and three of the case study. Uh, and then we'll take it through with the first exercise in the case study. Ta -da! So you're 22. And we're back in the room, back in the room. Here we go. Okay, can I just check, has everybody read the uh, case? Everyone okay with that? It's actually nothing to do with Miller's, uh, sorry, with Marmalade, it's a business transformation. They're moving away, or they're thinking of moving away from um, uh, a sort of fairly uh, haphazard um, sales mechanism through telephone calls and spreadsheets to become an online vendor. Um, and the other thing is that they're thinking of moving away or the, the, the uh, proposition is they should move away from most of their trade at the moment is business to business to dealing with Joe public. 
So it's change of change of a few things really widening out the uh, customer base to include your public, the real, you know, the end user customer, and also becoming an online vendor. <clears throat> so um, this was originally, um, uh, it's now been extended for use as a case study, but it was, the germ of this was a, uh, a real, real practitioner scenario. So it, it's going to be no lot more complicated than this when you see the real one, in fact, less so. Uh, but basically, if you look at what they're saying, and I'm happy answering questions, they're farmers, and they've, they've already moved into this marmalade market making uh, uh, environment. But at the moment, um, they're, uh, they're working mainly with biz business to business um, trade sales. Um, and then they're making mistakes. They're making mistakes in the way that uh, uh, they're working at the moment. So they've already got a business problem there. Um, they've, uh, uh, they, they didn't make much money last year, but they got some capital investors, but they, they are on a bit of a high as an enterprise because they've won the uh, golden orange in France, the orange door. Who wouldn't want to win the golden orange? I asked myself, maybe I didn't ask myself that. And they now looking to see the next kind of uh, step in the development of the company. And, um, Someone's had an idea. This someone is going to be you in a minute. Someone's had an idea that what we should do uh, is try and get on the 100 best food websites TV program, which is scheduled within six months. And if we could get on that, that would be a good launch for what we want to do. And the idea is um, that what we should try to do is start selling to Joe Public uh, and become an online vendor. And the, the good launch for this for this for this new venture will be this TV show. Now there's quite a lot of work to be done. Um, if they want to go idea, they've identified the fact they're going to have to upgrade their existing website, maybe build a new one. They're going to have to rebrand, move to bigger office, get six more staff, and do marketing campaigns. There's a lot of work there, and you know there are some numbers around that. It looks to me to be about ninety-seven thousand pounds worth of investment, to be honest um and um you know while they if they if they go for this change while they're going through it they've got to, they've got to keep existing sales up because the revenues from the existing side sales are important so so that's where we are any, any questions around that just painting the background so what, what i want you to do in the, in the groups i'll put you in in a moment is is the is the access oh less I'm sorry, you mentioned about 97,000 of your investment. I didn't get this. If you look at all the cuts towards the end, it's about 97K. Don't, don't get hung up on the figure. It's quite a lot of money. Uh -huh. Okay. You got the costs? You got the costings there at the end? Uh, you said that, that we need to read just the two first pages. I didn't get this, this number, the digits, 97,000. It's it under the work to be done page. There are 14 pages where I mentioned this the, the, this amount, this volume, 97,000. Right, it's 20,000 for the rebound, office move and refit, 35. Uh -huh. it, it's the sum, okay. I understand, okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so you've, you've got the costume. Okay, don't worry about them too much, but it's quite a lot of money. So the first exercise is called an elevator pitch exercise. I don't know if you've come across this idea. The idea is you've got someone stuck in the lift with you in the elevator, and you're gonna go and try and convince them something in a short time, but, um, what this is, you're, you, you happen, you've got this idea, right? You've got this idea for becoming an online vendor, selling to the public and getting on this TV program. It's you, right? You have this vision, okay? And you know your CEO, you know your CEO is having lunch in the staff, uh, in the staff restaurant. Now, I don't know whether it's lasagna, it could be ham, egg and chips. I'm not sure, not sure. It could even be a jacket potato. We haven't got that information. But basically, you're going to try and interrupt their lunch and sell them two things. One is the change. You're going to pitch the change to them, saying, "It would be. I think it would be really great if we did this because," which is kind of a vision statement. You know, this would be good for Miller's Marmalade to do this through this mechanism because. Um, and I also, you, you're quite keen on the agile way of working. I want you also to pull out some bullet points about why agile would be a good way of doing it. So just be aware, we're not, we're not down here. We're just thinking about whether there's something worth doing yet and whether Agile's a good way of doing it. 
So don't get hung up on costs and time scales or musts and shoulds and coulds. We're nowhere near that. All it is, is you're going to try to convince, it's a sales exercise, really. You're going to try and convince your CEO that this would be a good thing for Miller's Marmalade to do. So explain in a fairly succinct vision or objective statement why this would be a good thing to do. And also be able to pull out some bullet points about why Agile would be a good way of doing it. So there's no presentation. We don't want a presentation. Just what, why, why, what, what's in it for us as an organization? Miller's Marmalade would benefit from doing this because, because something like that. And why you think Agile would work. And if you think there's some risks to Agile, that'd be good too. So it's just a bullet point kind of idea, really. And to get you into the case study. Is that okay with everyone? So don't, don't overthink it. We're not doing musts and shoulds and coulds, any of that. We're just trying to justify um, <clears throat> the use of uh, going, making this, going for this change and also the use of Agile. So let me, uh, let me change the groups.